This is fucking ridiculous. This is this is crazy, man. No, it's not, dude. It's we're fun. we're live. I mean, we're live. <laughs> fucking, it probably sounds like I'm coming through a potato right now. So uh, Juan loves potatoes, by the way. In case anybody wants to send him boxes of heirloom potatoes, please do, because uh, you know. <sighs> It's delicious, it's nutritious, and we're losing the root vegetables left and right unless we come together as in a bowl community and start sharing crops by sending Juan potatoes. I'm talking loads, boxes, bushels, pallets, train loads, helicopters, drones. I want you guys freaking manifesting potatoes just growing in his yard. And through the astral travel, you sprout potatoes in Juan's yard. He's got a family to feed. He's got new babies. Okay. You guys, he needs potatoes. Okay. Who is going to send him potatoes? I already sent him a box of potatoes. I'm strapped out. I'm strapped out of Tate's kid. I can't do it anymore. Uh, anyways, man, you know, there's a special type of yeast that grows on potatoes. You guys should get into that. Uh, wow. This is, this is fucking, I don't even feel like doing this anymore, dude. Game, my, <laughs> my, my equipment is bugging out. I got all this money in fucking Roadcaster and Sure and all this, and I got nothing. I can't even record <laughs> this how I want to. <laughs> Paranoid American is late. He's the co-host. You are late. We got Barley Stone here without a shirt on. I don't even know what's happening right now. And then he tells Lord me before man. the show, he's like, ah, dude, it's because I did this ritual before coming on. And I think I might have bugged it out. So I, I have no idea what's happening right now. I did. Dude, should we all go shirtless? Yes. No, top we should not. You don't Pop the top. You don't want to see my nipples. I mean, maybe your nipples are not a lot nicer than mine, but you don't want to see mine. <laughs> or Paranoid I'm, Americans. I'm actually fully naked. <laughs> you almost got me to spit take, bro. I just got out of the shower. I mean, we haven't had hot water here on the farm in uh, like a month. And I got in the shower expecting just to get a quick rinse. Because, you know, I was like, all right, you know, cold water. You got to get ready and prepared for that. Popped in. It was hot as a hot as a, a kettle. And I was like, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I'm, who knows, dude? Who knows? It just it, it's so freeing. Okay, because my feet right now, my feet are in a pot of cop, a copper pot of water. And they've been charged by the full moon last night. I put it out. I put all my stones right. in there. We had this extra chicken carcass from uh, just a rotisserie chicken straight up. And, you know, I went out and I like placed it and I poured two beers around the chicken uh, carcass and I put it out above where the copper pot was and just, you know, tried to make it as like somewhat ceremonial as I could to try yeah. to ho hone in on it. And uh, then I was like, all right, well, I'm going to put my soak my feet in the pot while we're chatting and maybe we'll get some sweet it's, celestial downloads. It's fucking nasty, bro. It's not where the chicken carcass was. That was on a stump. <laughs> That's a legit offering, man. Yeah, I'm He's legit. Gone. I'm I'm, I'm like I'm mad right now. This threw my energy off, dude, because I was super stoked for this and I can't even record how I want to. You my sound soundboard great. my soundboard isn't even coming through. Oh, we'll just do our own Illuminati confirmed. Illuminati. I literally yeah. have done nothing to my setup too. Like I haven't changed anything. I brand, brand new cord. Just throw some hand signals when you want to. Uh, when you want us to do the soundboard noises, uh, Gable, get get one. I'll get the other one, and we'll just like you know. Just go like this if you want a dog howl. I <laughs> think. I think Paranoid American got abducted by, by the werewolf people because he's not even answering my, my texts. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on, guys, but some well, we're live. Ooh. Let's give it let's give let's start digging into this book because this is a good one. You you did you did you did good here, sir. This is a great Bro, game. what do you mean I did good? I always do good, bro. I always do good. Don't, don't. Hey, hey, you know I, I always do good. I mean, your percentages are, are getting better. The ratios, kid, I'll tell you what. They're getting better. But for a little bit, they was kind of like, ooh, I don't know, you know. <laughs> so 
here we are. I don't know where Paranoid American is. Welcome back to a cult book club number six. And this is The Book of Werewolves by Sabine Baring Gould. And I was looking up this guy, and apparently he was a prolific writer, over 1,240 publications, and the number is going up. So is this dude, did this guy figure out the elixir of life? He's writing after death or something? I, I don't know what's going on <laughs> with this guy. But apparently, let me pull up my notes here because I'm completely off guard. The Archons are fucking with my gear. I'm really pissed off right now. So this guy was a priest. He's do art. And he's a hagiographer. And I didn't know what that was. I was like, a hagiographer? What is that? Hagi what? So apparently it's a person that writes about saints in history and different figures within history because he's written a lot of things. And I had a synchronicity too. I don't know if, if she's in the chat or not, but Kaylee had sent me a message about this war astrologer that she heard about. His name was uh, Theophilus, I believe. And of course, I was doing some research and I looked up Sabine Baring Gould just to get some information on him. And he's written, again, over 1,200 books. He's a hymn writer, a hymn collector, which is kind of weird, too. A hymn collector. Wasn't, wasn't he a priest? Yeah, he's a priest, an antiquarian, a novelist, and an eclectic scholar. And he was born 1834, died 1924. He was 89 years old. He wrote about 12, 1,240 publications. And the list is growing. So Kaylee had hit me up with this guy called the Theo Life uh, Theophilus, and it was a war astrologer. I have a battle mage in Dungeons and Dragons. She's like, "Oh, this is really cool. You should check this guy out, right?" For maybe one of your shows. I was like, "Cool." So I'm looking up Sabine Baron Gould, and he wrote a book about medieval myths. And and sure enough, I'm looking through the table of contents, and what's the last chapter on this Theophilus guy? Where apparently they thought, it's like a little breakdown of his life. They thought that he was like a necromancer or something like that. Because they, like a John D, right? And he made a deal with the devil. And after he made the deal with the devil, everybody liked him. Everybody saw him in a different light. <laughs> and I think his day is February 4th. So he's a saint now. Yeah, he's a saint now. So when we start, see, see what happens when we start talking about the Freemasonic werewolves, <laughs> the Freemason shows up. Glad of you to, to join us, bro. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Homosexual Homunculus podcast. Coming to you live from the Dog Dick Society. Uh, here we are. Uh, so, Thomas, I'm having technical difficulties, bro. My yeah. camera's bugging out. My mic's not working. My mixer's blowing up. I don't, I don't know what's going on. But here we are. It's the and full I just, moon. Well, it wasn't that. It was actually Romy that said that he did a ritual before coming on the podcast, and he fucked it up for us. He was doing something with the chicken god or something, rubbing his nipples on a, a, a chicken carcass, and I don't know. <laughs> so here it's we are. Friday already? Fuck, bro. It's Friday already, dude. It's all right, dude. It's all right. We forgive you. The guys were wondering if you want nipple day. I just forgot about that. If you want to go shirtless or not, and I said no, but. I mean, you can. I had to wear my my werewolf shirt, and I don't know if, if uh, this is from um, when you go through the Air Force. Um, they all go through the exact same training compound, but you get split among one of like four or five groups. And my group uh, was the Wolf Pack, and I think it's still the Wolf Pack, oh. uh, the three thirty first Training Squadron. And <laughs> what's funny is there was like we can convey here there was like a like a child sacrifice essentially because. I believe it was like two or three months. I was going to try and look it up. I didn't think we started for another 40 minutes. But uh, there was a kid that had died because they made him just run uh, too long for like fucking like over an hour consecutively. And I think his, he had like heart condition that the, his family didn't know about. And he died from it. And the United States Air Force told this particular 331st training squadron that you're not allowed to make kids run for more than, I don't know, it was like 15 minutes straight or 20 minutes straight. There was like a certain limit to it. And all the other um, non-Wolf Pack groups adhered to that new standard. But the Wolf Pack, as long as I was there, they had never adhered to it. They still made people run the entire time, almost as like sticking their nose up at it. But I mean, in retrospect, um, I mean, it, it was it was probably done for a lot of different levels. Like I, I read a lot more into it now than I did at the time. At the time, I, I just felt like 
you know, a that you know, I mean, brainwashed part of me was like, oh, that kid was a pussy. He couldn't take it. You know, I can't do this thing. Blah, blah, blah. I'm, just yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but I mean, in, in retrospect, man, it was like, a look at how hard we can run you. B there was probably like a just get this fucking weak kid out of here type of mentality. But I think the worst one was just an absolute apathy of of not even like a sacrifice in the terms of that like once in a while uh, a mouse will get caught in the gears of the machine and it just grinds it up and whatever it's a sacrifice you know what i mean like that kind of a sacrifice it's collateral damage it's all good that, but anyways that's... the wolf pack man i just figured that out when i was putting the shirt on today i was like oh shit bro that's a pretty fucked up story bro that's, illuminati that's... confirmed that, that it, i would hit my what the fuck button but i don't got it so what the, what the, what the so I was talking about Sabine Barry and Gould and how a prolific prolific writer he was mm -hmm. and how he's still they're still publishing his works even till this day. So dude's dead. Wait, he's an alchemist. So I, I don't know. And he was a he was a priest and my synchronicity was the last chapter of one of his books was of a person that they had told me about with Kaylee. So I guess I'm gonna have to look into that because it was so some sort of confirmation about having to look into this war mage this war astrologer right so imagine that type that sounds badass but here we are and uh, let's plug our stuff i guess at this point i mean we're already about 10 something 11 minutes in juan one on juan podcast follow me on instagram tiktok twitter whatever uh homie romy what do you got bro hey uh rising from the ashes podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts we're also starting to do more youtube videos we're gonna work on some like um some cool like little youtube docs on um the uh the, the alchemical and esoteric history behind different products like glass and mirrors and jewelry and stuff like that so keep an eye out for that um also very stoked on this one because yes this author is very precarious uh the book itself was full of just and lycanthropy really threw me for a rabbit hole i mean it goes all the way back to ancient egypt and plus you know and so i'm um, really looking forward to this and and diving deep in what you boys here paranoid american you want to let people know where they can find you yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully uh, you're listening to us right now on the Occult Book Club, and you can go to occultbookclub.com <laughs> and just go right to the whole playlist of all the different shows and books that we reviewed. Uh, that's the closest thing that I got to a podcast right now. And then there's paranoidamerican.com and at paranoidamerican on Instagram to see all the latest kind of comic books and games and other kind of cool stuff that I'm working on. Yeah, I have. Uh, so my other idea is the Homosexual Homunculus podcast or the Dog Dick Society podcast. Those are other projects we have in the works. By the way, anybody listening to this show is a degenerate because that I still till this day I get messages about the Dog Dicks. And it's one of my top episodes as far as downloads go, the Dog Dick episode. So oh, all of you good. are a bunch of degenerates, whoever is listening to this stuff and hitting me up about the Dog Dicks. I don't want to hear about the dog dick dicks anymore please it just it just happens to be that we found a very particular dog date you know dog dick shaped niche that we were able to like perfectly cater to right well haven't you found yourself here yet again on the on the on the trans transformation into the perfect blend i'm of sure it's gonna come up man dicks. it's it's gonna come up at <laughs> i some got point. some shit let's let's let game plug his stuff and we'll get right into it Right on, right on. Yeah, uh, my channel is Slick Dissident on YouTube, and you can also catch me on uh, Chance Garden's Innerverse and uh, The Vibrant on Wednesday. Uh, that one's on Rockfin. Check us out over there, and uh, I get down with the Weaving Spiders Webs on Saturdays. Uh, and Weaving Spiders Webs also does something right after Vibrant's. Uh, we do the Flow State, so those are the places to catch me. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, and so this book, I want to say it was very, it caught me off guard. A lot of stories, a lot of stories, a lot of gore, right? A lot of gore, a lot of, a lot of cannibalism, magic, metempsychosis. Like it's got, this book has everything. It even talks about consciousness, everything. And it, and it, says it's the most important and most cited book on lycanthropy 
And I believe, of, that. I believe uh, that too. Yeah, hundred percent. And here's the thing. I don't talk about cryptids as much as I should. It is. I do believe in Bigfoot. I do think it's a more interdimensional thing, whatever. But here we are. So the book of werewolves, I don't know where you guys wanted to start with this. I, I would tell people to read it. I mean, if you like true crime type of thing, because how homie Romeo was saying, dude, these people were just killing people back then. Just like nothing, dude, like nothing. Just, oh, yeah. Hey, here you go. Here is, you know, I just killed 60 people. Ate their insides, good to go. <laughs> hey, you bada, go. Bada bing, bada boom, right? Hey, another day's so. work, kid. Another day's work. Piling up the werewolves <laughs> in the back seat of my car, my chariot, my brother. Uh, yeah, no. I what's cool for me is like I've been looking into this period of time, specifically like the Protestant Reformation and the Inquisition, and you know the Renaissance period and everything. Because, you know, obviously Renaissance magic and, and all of those, you know, <laughs> that whole uh, that whole paradigm. And then so the lycanthropy was <laughs> just another thick blanket onto that fucking textile and weave. And it's like, holy shit, dude. Like, you know, there are so many encounters and stories of this this mutation, uh, whether it being psychological or actually physical. You know, you have like the common uh uh, hairy palms if you if you see a guy and he's got hairy, hairy palms it's not well it is only because he'd be yanking on his dog dick but also because he in fact has a dog dick you know he was you can masturbate yourself into a transmutable form of a werewolf apparently and we're gonna be showing everyone how to do that tonight live <laughs> <laughs> we are we are not doing that shit so absolutely and for the this speaks to Right, because as a kid, I was always what's the story? The 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 three little pigs, right? It's a wolf in that in that story. I've always been told that story when I was growing up. Right, each wolf or each pig had built a different house made out of different material. So, I think again, it goes back to this idea, this primal idea of whatever we react to nowadays. When you flinch, that's that's your ancestors trying to get away from a wolf, right? Maybe not a werewolf, but a wolf or an animal or a saber tooth tiger, whatever it is, when you flinch at something, that's it goes back to those days. And I think at the beginning of this book, he talks about this story where they didn't want to walk back from a certain from a certain town after dark because they were they would encounter a werewolf. And I love the fact that he compares werewolves to dodo birds. And he talks about how how dodo birds went extinct. And that werewolves were actually pushed to extinction. That it's not that it's made up. It's that they, they were taken care of in these times, the medieval times and all this, mm -hmm. because there were so many accounts of people being attacked by werewolves. Right. Well, so, it made me think of like the whole Neanderthal dynamic too. Like if you believe in originally there was a whole bunch of different humans. There was, you know, roughly there was like four or five competing, maybe like three main contenders. And Homo sapien is what we've all got now essentially you know brutally performed genocide on everything that was somewhat close to them um is like the, one of the, the prevalent theories i guess uh, yeah they were just like hey these these things are always going to be a nuisance until we just eradicate them and that was the first thing that i thought of when i came across that in this book about that's such an interesting topic that maybe they're just used to be real and extinct and you've and i've heard things about like dragons and other kind of cool cryptids before too that maybe the early reports were real but they're not now because you know like maybe they're just some badass like you know B von baron dude with like a whole bunch of cool bigfoot heads on his wall somewhere and that's the <laughs> reason why we don't have bigfoot sightings or something you know who knows yeah dude i love that man they, you know I, I something i want to bring into this as well is like talking about cosmology and cosmological changes throughout time and history looking at things like the electric universe and the saturnian cosmology to explain the different uh times that earth has experienced different plasmon resonance or different um potent you know potential uh um extra plasma energy like when people talk about uaps or ufos or whatever um you, a large part of that community talks about you know the plasma energy and you know uh inter we, you, someone said sasquatch earlier being an interdimensional being well you know 
there's talk about that in the werewolf community as well. And so what if, and in ancient Chinese lore, what they, they thought that everybody had their spirit animal that came from their family line. Like it was passed down through genealogy. And so what if there was a time when, you know, you maybe resembled these animals more and through, you know, maybe different practices, maybe, maybe going to some sacred sites and doing some rituals, you might be able to actually change shape. But as earth goes through its, you know, uh, evolutionary state through, you know, being a fucking celestial body in, in the galaxy, you know, I mean, we're living <laughs> on a fucking giant living being that mutates how we live. You know, everybody wants to be fucking human centric with how we view everything, but we live on the planet and, you know, it controls what the fuck goes on here. And, uh, you know, there's enough of these stories of like, you know, a, a tr transformation, transformational stories all the way back to ancient Egypt, you know, and, and having hybridized. Um, and yes, some of it is, you know, archetypes and, you know, they were, they resembled this wolf because he was the God of the dead, like Osiris. Um, you know, I want to get into all that shit, man. But yeah, they say that, that they say that that's a, a different rendition. It's a more luxurious dog. It's not actually a wolf or a hyena or whatever they talk about. It's just yeah, the, the way jackal. it was illustrated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I want to say shout out to James Lovelock. I think he might have died this year, last year. He's the, the one that wrote about the Gaia theory of representing the earth as like this living organism and that things that live on top of it, it kind of adapts to them sort of like um like an immune system i think he describes the earth as an immune system at some points with like white blood cells that attack uh and other kind of like the, the similar you know macro micro yeah and yeah. let's not forget that right you're talking about cosmology and and all this has above so below stuff which somebody told me that i didn't know what that meant whatever shout out to that guy on tiktok but uh, the idea of kundalini, right, when you activate that serpent energy, it does produce a biological change within your body, right? That's the whole thing about that when you unlock that energy. So who's to say that these guys, maybe it is a state of mind, maybe it is, or maybe it was at some point either a curse or a sacred bloodline of people who were able to change their actual biology. If we go and look at the the ancient alien theory one of the theories is that these people had full genetic control of their of their of their biome that they could change what they were hence that's what doesn't rule out lizard people because i did ask a guy about it he's he said it was true so i said all right dude if that you ask a guy and the guy says it's true then it's got to be true it's like exactly. a natural law of threes like. on a podcast exactly but it's got to be on a podcast it's like a, it's like a rich it's got to be on a podcast for it to yeah. be true so if you ask the dude crying me or baby exactly if you ask them they they come on the podcast so and when I change hats, apparently that's that's part of my. my well, thing, well right? hold on. I just I just wanted to throw out because uh, how to start this off. I'm a sucker for chronology and just going through shit in order essentially. But the introduction here had one opening state. I think it was literally the first opening line that I wanted to read because I I loved it. And he basically says that I must acknowledge that I have been quite unsuccessful in obtaining a specimen of the animal, but I have found <laughs> traces in all directions. So he opens the book up saying like, look, like what you're about to read, like I haven't actually like, you know, straight to the point. I haven't found any substantial proof of werewolves, but here's everything that I've found that relates to it and kind of like, and that's really how the dude approaches it. And um, I was watching another review of this book and, and the guy uses a very uh, fitting term. He says secular. This is a very secular approach. And what a great term because... Mm -hmm. It's not it's not kind of like written cloaked in any kind of moralism. It's very much from a third point looking at like, OK, let's break down which cultures, um, you know, had any sort of like wolf, werewolf, lycanthropy uh, nods to them. And he and he goes into like three or four different cultures and he breaks down different actual like court proceedings and people that had been summoned in front of juries and tried and executed and all the fine details and notes of that. And it reminded me a little bit of like the Salem witch trials. So I, I don't know. I, I love this book. And when you said before that it's the most cited book and we were, we were all like, yeah, I can believe that it's because it's, it's written as like a reference book that 
anyone can read at any time, go right to, you know, the date or the culture that you're interested in. And this is very much going to be like your main starting point source material. Yeah, man. I like that too. I like how he uh, breaks it down by culture and region and gives you like the different terms for this, you know, similar ideas. And it gives you even the nuanced differences, you know, like some people just go into a trance and pop mm -hmm. out somewhere else as a wolf. Some people, they turn instantly. Some people, they only do it once or twice a year, sometimes every month, like very systematic breakdown. I really did. And, and he points out the differences and doesn't just like let it all blend mm -hmm. together into this one, you know, kind of like um, amorphic blob mm -hmm. of werewolf theory it's like yeah. no like here's the specific differences between these cultures and here's ones where the wolf and cannibalism are linked but other mm -hmm. ones where it's not linked and here's where wolves you know mean something literal versus something that you could <laughs> become based on the way that you're acting yeah. and uh yeah i love it man it's it's very like <laughs> i want to say scientific but uh secular is such a great it's, word it's for it. the dude was a scholar he went hard in the paint he goes hard in the paint when it comes to writing Again, over 1,240 publications. And apparently he's most well-known for a hymn, a hymn writer. He wrote a famous hymn, and that's what he's actually known for. But there are other esoteric works that I did bring some up when I was looking into him, and it was a lot of interesting stuff. So, yeah, he, he talks about, I believe, 100% that there might have been some bloodline or something, or people are able to tap into something. We know about this. We know about famous serial killers throughout history who made deals with the devil who mm -hmm. would have the power to shapeshift into a certain animal. Simon Magus, the father of all heresies, the father of the Gnostics, was known to shapeshift. He was, uh, Crowley was not, uh, supposedly turned one of his uh, Nuremberg, Victor, I think his name is Victor, uh, into a camel. But then they say it's in a magical sense. He, he shapeshifted him in a magical sense. And I wonder if... That was before he had assumed the position or after he had assumed the position. <laughs> Who knows, right? Well, there's a really cool thing that he brings up in one of the early chapters, too, that um, that originally this being a werewolf was like a curse that was that was put upon you by the gods. And one of the side effects of this curse is that the only, like you had this insatiable desire for human flesh specifically. And it was because turning into a, a wolf specifically uh, gave you like the most, I guess, you know, the most resources and tools to just devour as much human flesh as possible. And that's kind of where it's, <laughs> I, ne I never really understood that, or I never knew that, but it has its roots essentially in cannibalism and an, an explanation for cannibalism. And it seems like that's that nugget that everything else kind of sprawled out from and deviated. So, you know, who wrote about lycanthropy and the definition of lycanthropy, just to, to get it out of the way is uh, the change of manner of man or woman into the form of either wolf either through magical means so as to enable him or her to gratify the taste of human flesh or through judgment of the gods and punishment for some great offense i wonder why i say it's, uh, the change of man or woman i don't know why i said that but anyways i came across and daddy manly p hall actually wrote about this mm -hmm. in the horizon in one of his his magazines and I'm gonna look for it now it was issue uh, you guys can keep talking while I look All for right. this. While, while he's looking for that um, you know I do want to I do want to maybe like go through each chapter just to name the chapters in the book because like you said yeah, like the, 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 the way he lays it out is fucking fantastic very just like it's very secular it's fucking awesome um, I went on a couple other rabbit holes on this that I want to bring you guys. I think is pretty. No fun. way, dude. You you went <laughs> on a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Bring but, it, bring um, it. Yeah. But for, <laughs> for chronological chapters, yeah. chronological purposes, I I try to look up you know the etym etymological history of lichen and, and where it comes from. And uh, on the etymology online or etymon etymin online uh, website, it says. The word comes from ancient Greece, but we find that there is a ancient town as Isut uh, in ancient Egypt or otherwise known as Lycopolis. And Lycopolis is an ancient Egyptian town with the statues of um, of a wolf that was praised to be Osiris. But the town itself was said to be ran by Anubis who in the middle regions of Egypt was said to be the son of Osiris. But other stories say that he's the son of Set, which is Osiris's brother, anywho. And um, 
and then the other uh, ruler of that was how do you say Vetapet? Vetapet. It's um, kind of like the goddess version of Anubis, and sometimes get crossed together. But you have it dating back all the way to ancient Egypt, and I think that's probably where the real lore comes from, because you know recently on the show, we've been diving really deep into pyramids, talking to different authors. It's Egyptian month over on rising from the ashes, ancient Egyptian and Sumerian month. And so um, I'm, we're trying to get to the bottom, literally the bottom of the pyramid stories, right? Like what the fuck's really going on? And the consensus across the board is that there are in fact tunnels underneath all of the pyramid systems in China and ancient Egypt That's and especially fact. Mesoamerica. It's fact, right? Mm -hmm. Well, a new discovery that uh, we made uh, through through a couple different episodes is that the Mesoamerican temples, um, who also have a lot of, you know, wolf lore as well, uh, have these tunnels of cinnabar. Now, they are caves of cinnabar underneath the pyramids. This is very significant because when excavating these caves, what did they fucking find? but char marks on the pyramid walls or on these cave walls. Charring cinnabar releases the liquid mercury that's inside the cinnabar. Cinnabar is the number one way to get mercury, right? And so they built pyramids on top of these um, cinnabar caverns, and then they would rush water through it because these are waterways and specifically talking in Mesoamerica, not the um, get, try to get Egyptologists to fucking come out with any of these types of excavations is, is impossible. It won't fucking happen. Right. You're going to you're going to have to find alternative researchers and take their word on the Egyptian pyramids. But, um, you know, you find similarities across uh, Mercury underneath um, all the pyramids and in China. Uh, and, you know, we I've covered this before. And so what I'm getting at is, you know, there's there's a battery potential, right? There's like this energy uh, tap potentially mercurial waters used to be the electrolytic solution in some sort of massive battery system. But there's also the worship of baths back in ancient Egypt as well. And many stories of these baths that would be made. And then one of the um, one of the serps from the uh from the book was uh here we go um that they are transformed into wolves at the full moon the desire to run comes upon them at night and they leave their beds and jump out of a window and plunge into a fountain after the bath they come out covered with dense fur walking on all fours and commence a raid over fields and meadows through woods and villages biting all beasts and human beings that come their way at the approach of dawn they return to the spring and plunge into it and lose their furry skins and regain their deserted beds and oh. it's like what the fuck dude special baths to you know and the, the other thing with the lycanthropes throughout throughout all of the all of the stories is that they would rub a salve on them they would rub something on so skin. i have a question mr barley stone it's the question that everybody's has on their mind if they don't i'm still gonna fucking ask it anyways <laughs> but if i take this ointment right this mm -hmm. witch's ointment or salve or whatever it's, it's referred to and I apply it to my areas. Do I get a werewolf dick or do I turn into an entire werewolf? How does that work? Because I was actually disappointed at the lack thereof werewolf dicks in this book. I We right. need to start talking right. more about the dicks because they're part of the alchemical process, if people haven't noticed. But how does that work, bud? Do you turn into an entire werewolf completely or do you just that part of your body turns into it? What's dickless. going on? Werewolves are dickless. Right? Because they don't talk about that. They don't talk yeah, about the, the smoothie down there. One thing I did see was if a witch is turns into an animal, they won't have a tail. I think that's uh -huh. that's what it was. They won't have a, I forgot what they referred to it as, but the, an appendage, I guess. So if a wizard turns into an animal, they won't have a wand. <laughs> <laughs> They'll Can we talk? <laughs> They'll be wandering where their wand went. Because, <laughs> you know, we have these stories of familiars right, all throughout history. And I think it was that symbolic studies tune is like talking dicks, right? 
right, right back at you. So uh, this idea of familiars, right? Uh, I think it was that dogs aren't affected by becoming werewolves or something, and we know that the dog plays a, a vital role in in it's in the tarot. It's in different. The symbology is there. It's one of the first animals to be domesticated, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. And one thing that I found weird. Twenty thousand years ago. One thing I found weird was Paracelsus had a dog. And homie Romy knows where I'm going with this, but apparently uh, Paracelsus was having sex with his dog and something about the dog being Satan. Okay, so there's this idea Agrippa. of... Was it Agrippa or was it's it Agrippa. Paracelsus? Oh, it was Agrippa. Agrippa. Anyway. It, couldn't have been, it couldn't have been Paracelsus because he was castrated. He was oh, the really? God, he's the godfather of... Whole less dick medicine. Is that why he never had kids? Yeah, might be a werewolf. Yeah. His, his daddy be. chopped him up, so it had might. to be had to be the Agrippa. Okay, well, anyways, Agrippa, one of those. But the you idea still have a relationship with a dog. Let's not discount freaking Unix <laughs> from having you know bestial relations. Come on, bro. What the twenty twenty two? Yeah, the point again. again. I had the magic wand strap on. Maybe. But the idea that canines are mystical, I guess you could say. I don't know. I get one of my in my tarot, my tarot deck, there I, I think there's, there's like a dog fish or something. It's like a dog into turns into a mermaid. It's something weird. Anyways, it's in the 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 Wheel of Fortune card, I think it is. That's that's, that's the yeah. name. Yeah. So anyways, this idea of canines. And I wanted to bring up uh Daddy Manly P. Hall when he talked about lycanthropy. Uh the he talks about the word lycanthropy let me let me pull this up here the word lycanthropy which in folklore refers to the transformation of human beings into wolves usually by the use of magical spells is derived from the name lycaon a mythological king of ancient arcadia according to the legend the god zeus came to him disguised as a mortal and to test the divinity of his heavenly visitor like Cain placed before him a dish of human flesh. The god outraged by this sacrilegious act transformed like Cain into a wolf. There are several versions of this old story, and it has been suggested the originally that originally a blood ceremony was involved by which a stranger was initiated into a clan. It was common for clans to have animal totems, and a person accepted into the clan of the wolf might be referred to as having been transformed into the animal itself. We have this idea, so apparently this is the OG story of, of the werewolf. He was trying to give Zeus human meat, which apparently was a, is a really bad thing for, for a god to participate in. It's, 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 it's really disrespectful, but he was so pissed off that he turned him into uh, this werewolf. Now, there are ideas, and they touch on some of them in here, where you have certain indigenous groups of people who will wear certain garments in some cases a wolf pelt right uh, the skin of a wolf uh, the fur of a wolf and they will turn into that wolf the spirit of that animal will transfer into them but the hopi snake people would dress up as snakes and turn into snake people and they would do it around a campfire at night so again you have different versions of the same story so it just leads me to think is it an actual thing or is it not was it how this guy is alluding to was it like a, a race of people that were just killed off because we know back then you could accuse anybody of anything and get them killed and from this from this book that we're that we're reading killing people back then was super fucking easy it was just hey hey Romy, you want to go in and Take this guy out, dude. You want to just go yeah. and take this guy out? Let's let's go hell at the moon for a little bit and let's go fuck this dude up. So yep. you they know didn't have I mean? any SVU back then. You know what I mean? They didn't have the crime <laughs> ban. But but in the that'd be a good show point, though, right? The medieval <laughs> SVU be. dude. Can you imagine? Uh, dude, it would I'm just so be dumb. like it would just be like, oh yeah, he just died of old age. He's like twenty three or something. The devil has taken over him. Yes, but, the devil. In this book, well, they're defining lycanthropy and the origins of it. I thought I found two other references that he mentions. One is coanthropy, which is specifically the dog version, but he also goes out of his way to point out boanthropy. And if you know bo from the same prefix of bovine, um, boanthropy would be like the cow version of a werewolf. Dude, I have to tell you guys my fucking dream that happened. <laughs> that is like, okay, so two nights ago, 
I was sleeping with my head to the west. I've been trying to practice feng shui, right? They want you to sleep with your head to the east, or it's different for however however it goes for you. But for me, it's east and west. That's where I need to be put in my head of my bed. And sometimes I, I get too um, worked up sleeping with my head to the east. So I switch to the west. Boom, I knock right out. So I switch my head to the west, and I fucking knock right out. I have this dream of I'm lying in basically my room, basically my bed, and I'm holding this cow, this like definitely sacred cow. And I'm like, I'm hugging this cow. In you bed. need to be able to trigger those like 70s porno sound effects right now, man. We're missing out one. <laughs> I wish I no, could. No, listen, no, it was not bow, bow. sexual. It was not sexual at we're, all. We're making okay? it. We're making it that way. But I had, I had, see, here's the problem, right? Because I was looking into the shape shifting stuff and I was getting really into it. I was fine. I was getting really excited because I was like, this is a very interesting topic. And, um, but then later in the dream, the moon comes right up to my window and the moon has eyes and the moon is looking at us and like wants to take the cow away. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. This is, this is not, this is no. And so like, I'm like battling the moon psychologically to not take the cow away. And I had just learned about bone thropy. And, you know, you know, we were talking about ancient bloodlines and, and things that maybe be passed down through genealogical stuff. So then later in, the, in that book, this the, the, uh, the dictionary of mysticism uh, in the shape shifting uh, section, they bring up Crowley. Now, I've had a dream when last time we were doing the Jack Parsons in the Crowley deep dive, I had a dream about fucking Crowley. And he... You were fucking him, bro? Nice. No, I had a dream about that son of a fucker Crowley. And he was attached to the back of a neck of this other dude, this big old fucking, like, you know, gorged out fucking dude. And he was controlling him through his neck. And, like, you know, but that was one of his things was a shapeshifter. And so... You know, like it's just two different dreams of doing the weird research on like the heavy occult shit, and they come into my dreams the shapeshifters. That it's just very interesting, you know, because like sleep is like a trance that we put ourselves into every night. You know, the moon is what guides that trance. It's what is there and present, dominant in the sky. You know, when you sleep, and so there's that kind of like balance between this what is the moon significance to lycanthropy and the transmutation you know of it i mean every if you look at alchemy right you know you got all this the the cosmological uh, planetary alignments of the metals right and you know we're like in this big kiln and just constantly being worked and what have you and then they talk about the sun and the moon and it's just like we're just in an alchemical soup all day and I don't know, man. It's just been a lot of synchronicities with this shit. Well, uh, and not not to skip to that that usually wolves and werewolves in particular are supposed to be sort of uh, affected by silver. And there you've got a direct link right back to the alchemical link to the moon again. Yes, yeah. isn't that weird? And what was Alex Jones trying to sell? Wasn't he trying to sell silver for a certain type of thing? So don't so don't usually. say it because I got my first video removed from youtube so round of applause <clears throat> then again my first episode 90 taken off of youtube it feels good to be recognized for once by the lizard people and it's an honor but i don't want to get any more strikes so but this idea that that they do sell silver to right and it's it's not gold or anything else it's silver it's like that's kind of weird and and the whole thing with, with van helsing was werewolves right was that vampires that was werewolves wasn't it that movie, Van Helsing. We're gonna look it up. Well, he, he does Hunter. all. He does pretty much all of it. Vampire Hunter, Werewolf, and when the movie. Well, he's like a cryptid handyman. Then he's fucking yeah. everybody up. The werewolf. But also, the... silver, silver technically, I believe, has a higher like light index, uh, refraction index than any other metal as well. So, okay. even even among silver versus gold and platinum, silver can potentially reflect the most amount of light. Uh, so yeah. that makes it fairly unique. Again, tying back into you know most alchemists want the purest form of something. Well, if you need to be able to have a material that reflects light, pure silver is your closest way to get into that. And there's got to be, I don't think I've found it directly in this book, but maybe Gabe did, but there's got to be this direct link between, you know, silver and moon and werewolves and the reason yeah. why they are so yeah. interconnected. 
Yeah, one I wanted, of the big, Gabe, Gabe, take it away, man. We need to yeah. hear your your lycanthropies. Well, one of the biggest links with uh, the silver and the moon and the dog uh, comes into play with the moon card. The standard moon card in almost every deck shows two wolves or uh, two two dogs. One is often a wild dog, uh, maybe more wolf like, and the other one is a more domesticated or tame dog. And sometimes it's just depicted by the fact that one of the dogs is standing up ready to attack and they're uh, facing the moon and the other dog is sitting in a passive posture. Um, so that uh, definitely brings forward the Romulus and the Remus, uh, you know, the uh, founders of Rome, the two brothers of founding of Rome. And another factor there, nice, yeah. And another factor, uh, silver is indicative of the moon, uh, ritualistically, ceremonially, and the atomic number for silver is 47, 47. Well, that's a DG. 47 is DG. It's completely implicit in the symbols of the alchemy of the element of silver. Is has the dog, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, some people might be worshiping or venerating that the totem value of the dog. Yeah, nice. This is a good one, man. That's this is really what I was talking about earlier. We literally have dog man, and we have yes. we've had. That's also another thing where there are dog headed people as well, and we right. can get into that later because Gabe, not to cut you off, but you came up with. I wanted to get weird today. Then the whole audio issues threw me off, but you got weird, bro. You went what? there. I You went somewhere where I didn't know that you were going to go, but we're, we'll eventually get to that. And one thing that I found really interesting, uh, Herodotus even talked about werewolves. I'm like, Herod the, the, the great Herodotus, he's talking about people who change it once a year into a wolf and, and for several days and all this stuff. So, that again, it goes, this shit goes deep. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, also the very first of all the uh, major arcana cards, the fool card, it has a little dog by his side, typically. Uh, he's about to walk over a cliff. He's staring off into the sunset and there's often that dog that, yep. So uh, you can even think of um, the dog as being an initiation. You know, it definitely has a lot of initiation value. <clears throat> Um, and that's in almost every full card, but just think back to the very opening scene, initiation scene of Star Wars was Luke Skywalker looking up in off the cliff's face, staring at the two sons, and he's got his animus next to him, and that's R2-D2. He's got a little droid, so even R2-D2 next to Luke Skywalker he is uh, uh, encoding the fool card, and now let's take oh, the word Skywalker. Shit. Yep, let's take the word Skywalker, and let's put the first symbol of the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph. It looks like an N. The initiation of the Hebrew alphabet. It looks like a shape of an N, Aleph. And you place it in Skywalker's name, and you get the word Skinwalker. I was going to say Skywanker. <laughs> That that too, you can get that too. That's it, Skywanker, Skywanker, Luke Skywanker. That's it from now on. <laughs> so, uh, so there is there's an initiation uh, value to all of these signs and symbols. They're completely standardized, uh, and there's uh, just a lot of value in knowing that. Well, it goes back to the whole initiation thing, right? The esoteric versus the exoteric. And it goes back to that, where a certain class was supposed to have certain knowledge over the other, right? We can't forget that we have certain people, and even in this podcast, <laughs> who are part of secret societies, <laughs> which, yeah, me and my boys are going to meet up later and go out at the moon later for a little bit. So the, this idea that there is a, a class holding secrets, I mean, the whole Skinwalker thing was a curse put on by a shaman again the shaman class and back then we know the shaman class was highly regarded and they were the only ones that were able to go into the mysteries 
right? The, uh, some witches were able to turn into skinwalkers. You have other stories where it was a curse that was put on them. Or even the Wendigo, right? The Wendigo is similar to almost like a Western werewolf type of thing where it's you have to eat of a corpse in order you have to do some certain ritual to become this zombie like uh, what a cannibal i guess you could call it right a ghoul again and and that's why i didn't know that there was this many types of werewolf stories and it's always if you look it's region locked certain they have were where animals so in india was a tiger or in this other place it was a dragon and in this other place it was xyz my favorite was the one that i told you guys about the greek werewolf where the greek werewolf after he dies becomes a vampire that's wild that's so it's like a wild. like a phoenix the phoenix rises again it's like no 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 you're not i'm not done with you so when the werewolf is done boom dies and he comes back up as a vampire to suck the souls out of people so again very interesting and it's all tied into this lycanthropy so homeboy went deep you know yeah. ghouled ghouled cool. went yeah. deep <laughs> all right yes. so yes. he's even his middle name is bear like bearing yeah yeah. Very cool. So, uh, and, and you got to remember the story in the story in the Bible of Elijah, which is kind of fucked up, right? Like, yo, paranoid American, I don't like your fag beard and your bald head. And then God's like, you don't like his fag beard and his bald head? Let me sick two bears on you, motherfuckers. And he put two bears on these people and they tore them apart to pieces. Like, what are you? Yeah, that's, that's messed up. So. Again, these animals bring it, coming in and doing God's work, I guess, because that's what it, essentially it was. Homie, did you want to share something? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to share a little bit deeper on the uh, Herodotus uh, story because it's super interesting. And it kind of um, slightly esoterically ties back into the Egyptian lore, too. Um, uh, so anyways... Um, <clears throat> Herodotus uh, wrote the book, The Histories, a book for the histories. The Nuri people were the neighbors of the Scythians. The Scythian people inhabited a large territory, usually centered around Ukraine and southern Russia, but they lived a nomadic lifestyle, so their borders could be flexible. The Nurians were located somewhere on the border of this large swath of Scythian territory. Readers of the histories are introduced to the Neri people at a time of chaos. Herodotus wrote only a single generation before Darius I of Persia crossed the Danube River to attack the Scythians. The whole of the Nurian lands were infested with vicious snakes. Herodotus wrote a horde of snakes just suddenly and mysteriously appeared throughout the territory. To make matters worse, even more snakes were apparently pouring from the uninhabited land to the north. The snake infestation was so bad that the Nurians had to flee their lands and seek shelter from another nomadic group, the Bundinians, who lived in or near the area of Scythia. After this odd introduction to the Nuri people, Herodotus made another shocking disclosure. The Nurians were sorcerers and werewolves. Supposedly due to some sort of magic, the Nuri people, yes, the entire Nurian population, would turn into beasts for multiple days on seemingly a set annual cycle. After their few days as wolves were up, the Nurians would simply return to their original human form and life would go on as usual. Again, Herodotus quickly pointed out that the story was too far-fetched for his taste and he was only recording what was told to him by other Greeks and Scythians. He wrote, I do not believe this tale, but... Well, at the same time, they tell it and even swear the truth of it in Herodotus's book, Four of the Histories. Uh, nevertheless, the tale remained alive since the first century CE when a Roman geographer named Pomponius Mela made the mention of Nurian werewolves around 43, 44 CE. And so I, the I wanted, snakes. Yes. I wanted to add to that, uh, you know, speaking of, of, no, finish and, I, and I'll add my thing. Go ahead, so, so something that we're working on on the podcast is, you know, there's there's a lot of snake symbolism, right? It, it, there's many, many interpretations of it. But um, Egyptians from outside cultures were sometimes identified as snake people. Um, you know, sometimes even the Druid and Egyptian connection by uh, <clears throat> drawing the snakes, uh, which are sometimes, you know, interpreted as the, as the Druids out of Ireland. Um, well, they could be mystics and talking about Egyptian mystics. And if there was like some higher, uh, 
magical order of the snake people, you know, coming from the Nile or coming from these mystic schools. Um, you know, they and we already know that there's the, the wolf connection and the dog uh, connection to Osiris and Anubis, you know. And it's just there's so many crazy connections being made here and just making these ties is I mean, you know, you got to kind of like pull you got to kind of pull a thread. You'd be like, OK, well, they said snakes five fucking times in that. So what are they really talking about? Because they're really pointing at the snake symbolism here. It's all Twilight language. And you're talking about bringing it all together and connecting. Well, St. Augustine, right? We've done the Florida, the esoteric Florida episodes declared in one of his writings that he knew an old woman who was said to turn men into asses by her enchantments. <laughs> so you have even St. Augustine talking about turning people into well, other and animals. In that, in that same section, after he brings up St. Augustine, he brings up the tale of the golden ass, which is, um, if, if you've seen my my show with uh, Sam Tripoli on Tinfoil Hat about occult Disney, the tale of Pinocchio, specifically when he goes to Pleasure Island and turns into an ass, is essentially an, an occult retelling of that same kind of Gnostic tale. Yeah, I just learned that the, uh, the donkey and sacrificing of donkeys has a tie-in to the, I believe it's the Midsummer's Night Dream, the play, or the story that it's based on, where uh, Priapus who is a uh, not fully formed man. He's, he's small in, uh, he's diminutive. He's a little guy. But That's how he uses it. That's how he uses it. But, but he's got a huge dick. <laughs> and, and he's, uh, he's got this, that dick on him. <laughs> it, it's what bigger than he is. So he's, uh, he's at this party with all the gods and he's trying to seduce. Uh, I think it's, um, uh oh who's the sexy one uh aphrodite he's trying to seduce aphrodite and he sees that she's like drunk and she's about to you know lay down and take a rest or faint and so he tries to position himself so that she faints <laughs> on his lap Oops, just slipped on it Oops. And just when she's about to fall into his trap a donkey uh uh neighs and disturbs the spell and everybody wakes up and they see that she's about to slide on to Priapus's little trap. And so uh, from that point on, the sacrificing of a donkey is um, is venerating Priapus. It's getting revenge for uh, he almost had his moment. All the other gods get to get with Aphrodite, but he didn't get to because that fucking donkey got in the way. <laughs> and and it might seem like this is a tangent, but it, but it really isn't because the, the whole entire point of this this second chapter we're essentially recapping right now the point that he's making is that um all these different tales of animal transformation share like a lot of similarities and that certain cultures yeah it was specifically werewolves and that's a cool aspect of it but he also incorporates um and i think snakes does come up in this book more than it a does different times so it's yeah. like mm -hmm. wolves snakes and then a whole bunch of other examples that you can kind of think of um, but it's like he doesn't discount, even though the title of the book is about werewolves, um, all throughout the book, he continues to cite other animals and transformations that match these same sort of stories. Nice. Yeah. And he talks about, right. So, for example, chapter three, the werewolf in the north, the origins of the Scandinavian werewolf, the werewolf in the Middle Ages. And then you have the folklore relating to werewolves. So it's a bunch of different things of essentially the same. That's why I mentioned earlier that. Maybe it was a group of people. Maybe it was some sort of people who had a certain type of gene that they were able to tap into, or they had no control over it. A certain type of day, what Mr. Barley Stone was talking about, some astrological alignment, and boom. Because ever since you've known about werewolves, what's been the whole thing? On a full moon. Right? They howl at the moon. Maybe mm -hmm. it was some cosplayers who took it too far in the medieval <laughs> ages, and they were just outside doing weird shit. They were pagans. They were just outside... Yeah. You know, let their nipples air out a little bit and just howl at the moon for. Sometimes yeah. it feels good to be weird, doesn't it? I mean, that's, that's <laughs> what... <laughs> they, they just identified as wolves, right? It was just like a really ancient <laughs> version of identifying as a wolf. Exactly. So I've heard some uh, really compelling ideas of you know of how to maybe psychologically 
trick somebody into some of these behavior patterns. Don't you try it. Uh, on me. We have an NLP certified expert with us here and a Freemason with us. Gabe, so <laughs> be careful. Yeah, right? I'm both. Yeah, I'm both, man. You watch yourself. <laughs> this dude's so, shady as fuck. So this is this is where like um the word spawn and the word brood, like some of these words still are used in our in our language. For example, in a lot of secret societies and even AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, you have a sponsor. And your sponsor is like your mentor. He's the person you go to when you're, you know, when you're in need. So that's, you're, they're siring you, you know, they're your alpha, they're your, uh, your guide, basically. But it has these ingredients of uh, spawning and siring, bringing somebody else into the mysteries. And so uh, this explanation, it was a very long time ago. I don't have any receipts, but I can, you know, relay the basic gist of it is, that uh, so, uh, for example, in Ro in military Rome, they were they had a big stiffy for dogs. They still, you know, Lupercalia is a Roman holiday that is obfuscated by Valentine's Day. So we think of like, oh, it's cutesy wootsy bullshit with this cherub and his bow and arrow, but it's actually eclipsing or occulting a much more nefarious. Uh, sacred holiday to these people who are, you know, still down with these Roman traditions. So if you're going to sire a Roman soldier into bloodlust, one of the rituals is that the, uh, <laughs> that the, uh, their, their sire, their master, their leader, their guide, he actually gets to take all the drugs eat the mushrooms, snort the powder, do all the things. He gets like the full benefit of it, but he only allows his, uh, his minion, his up and coming minion. He only allows him his familiar, uh, his familiar. He allows him to suck on the blood. It's actually, they get, it's, it gets all sexual, but the way it was described to me is a slice oh, on, the, on the breast. Nice. And then yeah. the minion gets to suck the blood off of their breast. And this literally instills a passion, a fervor, a desire to drink blood. To a dog's a man's best friend, as they say. So <laughs> what, right. is it a friend with benefits or another type <laughs> of friend? <laughs> well, this, this, I think that this has a lot to do with the, uh, uh, the cult of Mithra. And if you look up the Mithra slaying the bull, you will see all the ingredients of what I just said. You'll see a snake. You'll see a dog. You'll see a young soldier. You have that picture woman. by any chance? I do. He's trying to prove himself, and he's making a slit on the bowl. Um, and that slit is very much like uh, what a uh, aspiring minion would be trying to consume. Let's see. Yeah, I had a I had a video I was originally supposed to play at the beginning of the podcast, but obviously Thomas the Michael was late, Jackson so we thriller? didn't. The twelve no, minute video. No, not fucking Michael Jackson thriller. Got the, the fuck? Are you guys seeing it? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So this is Mithra slaying the bull, and you can see how young he is. You can see he's actually that technique is very. Uh, ergonomically accurate that's a, you put the knee to the back you know that's exactly how it would be done but you know the serpent represents uh uh wisdom of entheogens you know there are uh, certain all poisons uh can be beneficial in moderation you know so the serpent represents the entheogens uh the dog represents obedience uh, and the cow represents food. You got to kill to eat. Uh, so uh, it's got a lot of key ingredients to these psychological uh, uh, aspects of what it takes to make a werewolf, to generate uh, bloodlust. Yes. So yeah. oh. essentially it's, an alchemical sculpture. I mean, it's got all the elements to it in order to almost some sort of talisman, if you will. Uh, right, we, right. And you could even say, you know, you could say that it's a marriage. Okay, so think of it this way also, culturally. The bull is uh, Egyptological. The snake is Scythian. And the dog is Roman. 
And so what this whole process, this whole ritual is a culmination of these empires, you know, Persian, Roman, Egyptian empires are coming together uh, and they're getting the benefit of that culmination of all that knowledge by generating uh, better mind control soldiers. And I, I mean, I think I'm here for one reason. And this is my reason is to point out that in many depictions of this, uh, of Mithra, of you know this entire scene being conveyed, um, the snake is typically attacking the genitals of the bull specifically. Wow, interesting. If I'm, uh, I'm actually, I'm looking up. There's a there's a phrase called teroctony, which represents just the practice of killing a bull. And there's a, an entire section on here on Mithras, and it specifically uh, mentions this entire. It says that. Uh, the dog and the serpent are typically set for reaching for a wound. Oh, sorry. While a scorpion is typically set at the genitals of the dying bull. Uh, so, and these are all, you know, these are all astrological symbols. You've got the mm -hmm. dog, the serpent, the scorpion. I mean, this is, there. these there are was, encoded, you know, yeah. Daddy Hall would let you know. These are encoded symbols that so, are instructed for checked like it. astrological. There was a scorpion on there. I didn't see that. Yeah. I just missed it. If, if it's real, it should have a scorpion on, on the balls. Remember that. If you're looking for the Mithraic yeah. mysteries, yeah. look for the scorpion on the nose. So it's not yeah. grab the bull yeah. by the yeah. horns. It's grab the bull by the horn. That's With what your <laughs> you got to use <laughs> too. I, I'm just saying, my, I'm, a, I'm a Scorpio. In that dream, I was cuddling that bowl. You know, I was cuddling the bowl in my bed, dude. Yo, and Roman is sus yeah. as fuck in his dreams, bro. Dude, I'm Damn, telling bro. you, bro. We be out here astro traveling, baby. So let's not forget. So we have this idea of Mithras, uh, sort of initiating, right? The, the these people or whoever it may be in these stories. So the method of transformation changes, which we can get into that. But also one thing that I found really interesting too, when when it came to these different accounts, and and th this book is full of different accounts, like hundreds of accounts probably, of just different stories, different people doing different things. One thing that I found really interesting was that they always had some sort of master. And it was always some sort of master of the woods, almost like a pan type character. Mm. This this man in the shadows. It's like, who gave you that ointment? Well, my master of the woods gave me this ointment. Mm. It's like, oh, who, who initiated? My master... Oh. My master was the one that that sh he was able to do it a lot better than I was. You know what I mean? He was the one that was able to to transform even quicker than I ever could, or something. Like that. There was always that hint at that there was somebody else in the shadows, and you can take that either metaphorically or literally. In this case, you know what I mean. Well, he, he had a really early reference to this. He said that uh, Virgil, and and I think Virgil was like around twenty BC, that he <clears> wrote about a wizard named Moiris that used herbs and potions from the Black Sea, and he created this potion that could transform yourself into a wolf that could prowl the war, uh, the wolf, the woods at night, mm -hmm. and it had the additional ability to summon souls of the dead from their graves. Um, so, like, there yes. was definitely that same exact aspect that you're talking about going back, and we're talking literally uh, 20 BC that this was being exclaimed. I like that. That's fucking cool as hell. That makes me that think of Cersei. Stupid. Cersei has similar aspects. Mm -hmm. And that even makes me wonder about the Black Sea having a lot more to do with the term black magic than oh, maybe it's, yo. Than and and it's he refers to it as the as Pontus, uh, the Black Sea. Right. And isn't interesting. it interesting? I'm going to have to look on a map, but that's really close to the uh, the Black Forest in southern Germany, too. I mean, we're mm, really Hungary close in there. Germany. Oh, yeah. I might black I'll have to look at that. But, I think that forest might brush up real close to the Black Sea. That's fucking cool. And I and I had two just small notes from Chapter Three because Juan, you mentioned Chapter Three was Werewolf in the North, and it's getting into all the different. And let's not forget of, also because we're talking about the world for real quick. Thomas, not to cut you off, but Game of Thrones, right? Jon Snow, the North, and what was the, his whole family's uh -huh. animal? Because HBO is coming out with the new uh, new series coming out here soon. It was the wolf so and he was a bastard 
Gabe. He was a bastard, so that plays into a role. Maybe something we're gonna get into later because we uh, haven't gotten weird. We haven't gotten weird yet. All right, we haven't gotten. We're just we're just putting in the tip, <laughs> but not quite there yet. You know, she's about to sit down, and, and then the the donkey's about to neigh. So well, we're so, we're, so in, we're getting in the there. Book, he start he starts out real broad, and he and he kind of in chapter two, he's like, here's all these you know the oldest historical accounts, and he's dropping names. He's like, bam, Pliny the Elder, bam, Herodotus, you know, like, uh, bam, Virgil, like, here's what the OGs have to say about it to kind of build this framework. And at, in chapter three, uh, it's very general and broad. He's talking about like a whole bunch of different. It's almost like an entry to the rest of the chapters he's about to get into. And I noted two very specific things that. Uh, he was trying to convey in a few different ways. And it's like the rules of how to be a vampire. And so according to Baron, uh, what's his name? Baron Sebring? <laughs> We're going to call him Baron. No, uh, his name, say it right. Damn it. His name is Daddy Ghoul. Gould. Okay, so, Gould. According to Daddy Gould, the, the two main from chapter three on, the rules of being a werewolf is that, um, A, you maintain your human faculties which is completely different than actually becoming a literal wolf. Cause there are some other accounts that he gets into where you can sort of don the skin of a wolf or pair yourself with a wolf. Mm -hmm. But when you do that, you kind of leave your human body and it's like lifeless somewhere. It's like, you, you know, you go into like an astral projection realm and then just lay there wolf, rock go and solid do things bro. As a wolf. <laughs> but this is a complete, this is a very important distinction that he makes in chapter three that, a werewolf is essentially you take on all the characteristics of wolf. You can look like a wolf, act like a wolf, but you get to maintain your human faculties. You get to make all your same human decisions, even if it's, you know, heavily biased by being a wolf after human flesh. And the other thing that uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a rule, but it was a cool thing that I had never heard described uh, with, with such emphasis. And that's that some of these werewolves he mentions, um, have eyes charmed so that they could only be perceived under the selected form. And what mm -hmm. he's saying here is mm -hmm. that they might not actually be turning into a werewolf. They might just be tricking you into seeing it. Yeah. Or in a shape-shifting way, it might be the exact inverse of that. Maybe they are transforming into a literal werewolf or a literal snake. That was real big back then. to charm you so that you don't see them in this different form. So there's yeah. like a, a they live, you know. Like I'm here to fucking chew gum and kick butt, you know, bubble gum, kick ass kind of way. So like they're actually a literal werewolf right in front of you. Maybe you're fucking sneezing and like allergic to it, and you don't realize why you're sneezing because you're standing in a room next to a werewolf. It, it, yeah, back to yeah. back to the electrical charge or like the plasma charge, you know, being able to control the elements. That's you know what magic and sorcery is, and so you know. <clears throat> using things like stone stone is uh there's a lot of the lore that's like the, they have to take their clothes off because in order for to transform like your clothes will transform with you and then you won't have any clothes when you come back but the clothes are yeah. a significant part of it too because you got to get naked and but this the clothes would turn to stone sometimes and then they would reappear as the human body later or they had to like, I remember one time, the, the one story in this book, there's so many fucking awesome stories, that this guy, before swimming through this lake, to go through the lake, I don't know if you guys remember that one, he had to hang his clothes on an oak tree. And that made me think about uh, lichen. Lichen is a plant. It's like a moss, right? Yeah, and, man. And I was like, oh shit, lycanthropy. Okay, well, what is lichen? You know, it's, it's like a moss, but it's you know it's not a plant itself it has to have a host you know lichen has to have a host and you know i take my dogs for walks i live in the woods you know i'm up here in the mountain and i see a lot of trees that have kind of like human figures you know they're kind of like they're kind of like you know the bipedal bodies of the plant world you know they're they're old ancient mystics you know and some yeah. trees have creepy sorceric vibes well what you got any of them, them them thick saxy trees out there Dude, we got and out here we got madrones and manzanitas that peel their bark. And it's possibly one of the most beautiful trees you'll ever see. It's very feminine because the way it peels its bark, it leaves back this really smooth like skin. Uh, uh -huh. It's called the madrone tree. It's super <sighs> cool. Like, have you, have yeah. you fucked the tree? Just come out with it, bro. Yeah, I mean, I've made out with lots of trees. Okay, but look, look, so so this is what I was looking up. Right, I was like, now I was like, okay. So I looked up the etymology of lichen, right, for lycanthropy, and that goes back to Lycanpolis, that city in Egypt. And I was like, well, where does lichen, L-I-C-H-E-N, come from? And they say it's from lichen. It's from like this 
uh, northern uh, like Germanic language of of licking to lick something. And I was like, why? What lick it and stick it on there? It's like hair. If you think of a tree as a body, it grows like excessive hair. Like what happens when you start to develop lycanthropy? Your hair grows. It grow excessive inward. Hair. It grows inward. That's yeah, a very it, important part. They say you would cut the skin and you would find hair underneath instead of blood. That's one way to check a werewolf. Whoa. And uh, but I was like, man, but I found psychedelic lichen. Lichen yeah, produces psilocybin. And then you start thinking about well, psilocybin as this shape shifting, you know, thing, it, it takes over lidocaine. Lidocaine. You got Ooh. canine there too. That's Ooh, nice. 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 That shit in the Mm -hmm. one, one more weave on this and then I'm done when I'm done with the lichen, the hair and the werewolf tree thing, because the, the oak tree, right? He had to hang his clothes on the oak tree. It's like the lichen clothes is like the moss. Um, but the German Purity Act, right? There's other stories where they said they had to drink a special beer. And I was thinking about the German Purity Act is this thing where they had to stop using all of these magical, beautiful herbs to create beer for the masses. You had to use rice, barley, hops. You had to use very specific uh, ecclesiastical things to make fucking brew. No more magical mead. No <laughs> more fucking magical drinks for you. Because if you shapeshift again, we're going to fucking burn you. You know, we're already killing massive amounts of people, whether or not they're fucking part of the church. Right. And so I was like, okay, bro. I was like the German purity act had to play some sort of role in wiping out these magical Damn. elixirs over time. Well, look, I want to, I'm going to completely forget to bring this up later. And you mentioned this with the beer and there was like such a cool, uh, later in chapter five or something, he mentions yeah. that in the middle ages, the number one way to tell the difference between actual wolves and werewolves and that a human that had turned into a wolf and looked like a wolf is that the wool the werewolves would break into the cellars and they would break open all the beer barrels and they would leave the beer barrels stacked up after they leave so you could tell <laughs> if werewolves had raided your house or if just regular <laughs> dogs had raided your house yeah bro so yeah. in uh, in chapter 5 he he carefully explains this he says so they they burst into the beer cellars and there they put the empty tons of beer or mead and pile up the empty casks one above the other in the middle of the cellar thus showing the difference from natural and genuine wolves. Yep. I love that. I love can that. I, can, can I add something before I forget? Because Paranormal American brought up the rules, right, of being a becoming a werewolf, how you have to adhere by some rules. Well, it sure sounds a lot to me like, right, what's rule number one? There is no fight club. And like, what's rule number two is that you don't talk about fight club. So, and what was the whole thing in that, in that movie? It was about becoming something that you're truly not and at the end of the day it was all well it was all make-believe and this idea that you're able to trick somebody into seeing what is actually not there well during the witch trials of the inquisition the peak of which occurred in the 16th and 17th centuries and coincidentally enough this was a time when there was a bunch of werewolf attacks going on all throughout europe and, and france france is really where the werewolf was kind of born and uh, European demonologists debated whether shapeshifting could be conferred by the devil and his demons or was merely a demonically inspired illusion. Some demonologists accepted shapeshifting as a literal fact, while others said it was physically impossible and thus was a demonic illusion. So you have this, this fight between the people in that, in that community fighting about whether it is an actual thing or not. And I think maybe it might be a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. You know, I, I'm going to kind of weave, uh, you know, what uh, Thomas was saying about uh, having a glamour, having uh, this illusion, this covering of, you know, maybe you were transformed into a monster internally and you go out on, you know, on a rampage and you really fully believe that you're a werewolf. And then uh, also to tie it into the lichen, and the possibility of maybe the lichen is an ingredient for some un, undisclosed elixir that oh, may have been shit, made. Son. And this goes back to initiatory practices where mm -hmm. there is a communion before you go through a ritual. I got something. And, 
and the communion has ingredients that are not disclosed to the initiate. And after it sets in, the ritual is prolonged just to the right length of time so that the magic is kicking in. Often, oftentimes there's all this song and dance and theater and they know the timing of when it's gonna hit your blood and you're gonna be prone to suggestion. And from that point, they can tell you, abracadabra, you're now a wolf. And I need you to go kill that fucking sheep with your bare hands and do it the way a wolf would do it. Be true to your nature. And they're totally prone to suggestion because yeah. they drank the beer. Now they think that they're a bear. They think that they're transformed into some different animal. I fucking love this weave. And where does the lichen grow? It grows on the bark. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, and uh, and Usnia is one of the most famous lichens. It's another term for it is uh, Merlin's beard or the or the witch's or the wizard's beard. Merlin. Uh, <laughs> so just another sorcerer tie because they say, yeah. you know, you're if you're a and, sorcerer, you shape shift into a dog. And another beer slash bear link in here. And to tie it back into the, the chapters here in chapter four, this is by far my favorite uh, tangent that he kind of, kind of goes on. So we're talking about werewolves, but then he mentions bear skin and the bear equivalent of a werewolf and that berserker, berserker or a yes. berserker from oh, the, yes. you know, the Vikings. Yeah. This is the guy that would just like run out into the battlefield and just slaughter everybody. Well, what was he taking though? Just... He was taking psychedelics and he well, thought he was. That, that That's one of the cool, yeah, that maybe they had like Amanita, Muscaria, or they had some other sort of like the, uh, the mana that they would eat and then be able to, I mean, literally they had stories about um, you know, knives and swords couldn't penetrate their skin. It would just bounce right off of them. Giggity. But they would talk about these huge bear skins that they would wear um, and that the, the term berserker um, also meant like bear of Sark, with Sark being sort of like your clothing. And if you look into the roots of that, the the French term is are still very similar to the same root that kind of links this berserker together. And what would happen is the berserker would put on a bear skin and that bear skin would help them transform into this like superhuman again with the faculties of a human being, but now taking on these properties of this crazy bear. And if you look at a lot of bear skin and uh, and the bear fur, they're actually created for like hibernation and for cold climates, but they're made to absorb as much sunlight as they possibly can out of all the other animals, which is an, again interesting. Like you've got these links to silver reflecting the most amount of light. You've got bear ah. skin uh, mm -hmm. absorbing the most amount of sunlight. And he also goes into this story about like berserkers could literally put on don this bear skin, turn into this berserker break into a tavern and just decide like that's my beer now and just drink it and if anyone beer. like stepped up to the berserker like they might just make a point and just kill you just for the fun of it and again yeah. this is that same mentality of like i've turned yeah. into this werewolf now i can just like murder people because i've taken on this animalistic intent even though i still have my human faculties so oh. and i never considered that a berserker like this viking berserker this badass was essentially like a norse scandinavian version of a werewolf yeah, man, there's yep. so there's so much to that 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 you know still to this day legally think about it you know the fact that if you don't respond to a court summons or whatever then they're just going to do whatever the fuck they want to you they consider it tacit agreement that mentality in our modern day sophisticated civilized society is sourced back to this Norse tradition that if you are uh, challenged. If some uh, somebody comes on and they say, hey, I think all of your land, including your wife, belongs to me now, uh, then you absolutely have to rise to the challenge and fight for your fucking life to survive. And it's just amazing that something that so many people, would be, oh, that's so primitive. That's so primitive. That's well, how I got my house now. That's right. It's like fully institutionalized. Knock on the door. It's like, this is my house now. We got to fight for it. Adverse possession, straight up. It's still a thing. It's still totally a thing. And it uh, it just hails back to that. Here, I'm going to bring up uh, a amazing weed. All all props to you, Juan. <laughs> this is so, this is so, so fucking cool. While you're bringing that up, I wanted to add because you were, we're, talking, we're talking some stuff. So what you were talking about earlier, and I lost the damn page. So it was what 
Gabe was saying about having a sorcerer or a wizard or something. And, jeez, oh, I can't believe I lost this damn. Wow, Juan. Wow, Seriously? bro. I, I wanted to throw in two Berserker. I found it interesting. They mentioned that one of the only cures for uh, <laughs> Berserker Rage was a Christian baptism. And I thought that seemed. <laughs> that sounds like way. fucking propaganda to me. Is I put the Berserker like. down for a fucking. Try doing that. Like, imagine the priest, the dick and balls on the priest. Imagine the <laughs> like the vampire cock on that guy. He's got to like. He's like, all right, we got to mount this berserker. Got to get him down to sub. And I, I could gotta... not hear the berserker song from the original uh, Clerks oh, movie constantly yes. playing in my head. Berserker, berserker. <laughs> Great call. There you so, go. Yeah, I found man. it. So after you're done, Gabe, I'll, I'll say it. All right. So yeah, this is from you know this is from Juan. He brought this forward back when we were doing our HP Lovecraft. And this sent me down all kinds of connections. But uh, obviously, you know, right on the surface, we've got HP Lovecraft. Wow. <laughs> Looks just like our fucking boy Berserker, Berserker Berg here. And look at HP's mouth. Look close at his mouth. It looks like he's covering up got fucking... got a pretty mouth. He looks like he's covering up fangs. Like he's got the vampire going on. And he's hiding Dude. it. It's, Dude, it's, this is fucking underworld af. Right, yeah. right. And, and so we, in our weave on Lovecraft, uh, we pointed out that his family history has all the signs and symbols of them uh, overprotecting him, keeping him way more safe than seems uh, reasonable. And I'm thinking that is a telltale indicator of hemophilia. And the fact that if he did trip and fall and scrape himself, he might bleed out. And that would be a good explanation for why his uh, his matriarchs were so overbearing on him and why he was such a shut-in. Because he had potentially, if he's of a royal bloodline, if there's so much interbreeding that he has hemophilia, it would explain his fear of going out into the world. And so now I want to point out, and it's right here in writing, hemophilia literally translates to the love of blood a blood lover and also i got illuminati confirmed so yeah bro confirm. yep and i gotta point out the hp <laughs> the hp yeah. could be insinuating hemophiliac those high priests might be a bloodline so let's look at mark zuckerberg's name and how let's see up uh, and what it might entail if i can do this right here we go Zuckerberg might be pointing at a berserker. You flip around his letters and you get berserker. And this is from the book there. Uh, the berserker meant either bear, bear shirt, as in wearing a bear skin, uh, uh, metaphorical wearing the mantle of the bear skin, or bear shirt, like fucking homie Romy over here. <laughs> you fucking berserker, Barley Stone, you. <laughs> that is with no shirt or no armor at all. The play on words is the same in English and Old Norse. Uh, you guys can read this uh, on your own, but I want to point out this fi this uh, this figure here is uh, this is the traditional depiction of a berserker. They are chomping. At the bit, gnawing, yeah, they're gnawing. gnawing at their own shield for a war, for battle. That's how eager they are. And I'm gonna be real weird here, uh, like I always am. Fucking do it, fucking dude, send I, it, dude. I think the chewing on the shield is insinuating that they've uh, they've been fed the placenta, the shield. I was about to say the fucking the Nazis that were just coked up, just really just fucking go, dude. Yeah, Inglorious man. bastard style, you know what I mean? Well, and yep. if, if you're talking about placenta shields and, and blood and shields, yep. I'm thinking of red shield and red shield. If you Rothstein. translate that in a Germanic, I'm not going to say the full name that it produces because one already got a hit, but uh, yeah. the red shields might also tie into this somehow. Yeah, buddy. Yep, for sure. It even has the word child. It's the red child. Hey, the you're baby. getting close. You're getting too close. Oh, oh shit. Yeah, yeah back it up. up. Until you're, you're at a fucking, like, 10. Bring it down to a 7 <laughs> or a 6, all right? Because that's part of the alchemical process. The red child is is part of the alchemical process. The perfect you have the, ruby. The ruby. Yeah, yeah. so let's and back it up. And got a guy with a big red beard, right? 
Right yeah, and, and, and to later. add the yeah. hemophiliacs back then, they were so prone to bleeding out that that royalty they would literally be carried around, and they were literally lap dogs because they were so fragile because they had been interbred so much and what happens to dogs as well they're interbred so much they have all types of health issues yeah. and all these different dog breeds they're literally homunculuses yeah. of of they're just chimeras of a well, bunch of different you, how do you protect these fragile royal children but with a big red shield but nice. we're gonna we're gonna step back we're stepping back yeah, yeah, so yeah. You, you got the homunculus and you got the frankenstein characters right you got like the big giant nephilim with also the tiny frail weak lap dogs the werewolves with the lap dogs that's interesting good point well we we gotta good. make you, you gotta understand that the homunculus plays a role into this let's not let's not forget because and if if i recall correctly paracelsus was one of the first ones to really talk about the homunculus and he also has a concoction because uh, we're talking about slashing people with their swords. Well, he had this thing, and, I, and I, I'll probably have to look it up, but he would make this ointment of different mixtures, but one of the main things was a certain type of moss, and he would put that in the cut, and they would anoint the cut of the person, and they would anoint the sword of the person, of the of what that killed the person. And let's not forget that that, that hurt the person. Let's not forget that for you to have certain magical powers, if you make a homunculus and you kill it and do things with its body parts, you get granted certain powers depending mm -hmm. on which part and how mm -hmm. old the homunculus was. Yeah. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that these guys were making this ointment, right? This ointment that they were making from from homunculus. Like, hey, dude, I found out that if you let him stay for two years, you turn into a werewolf or whatever. Yeah. Again, it's, <laughs> it's, like it's reaching, box. but it's not out of the realm of possibility it's like you find like a like a two-year-old sour patch kid under your couch <laughs> that's cool like, right? a, like a homunculus yeah. you got supernatural yeah. powers it's absolutely yeah. and shit it's running on a hamster wheel it's made out of the dixie <laughs> cup so it's like ah, you see it down there you're like should i eat so it? I to add to add to this idea of of the ointment one of the things that i found a parallel to and we all know Baphomet, right? Daddy Baphomet. We Wait, all know him. Love. Baphomet, you know him, right? Yeah. So what was one of the things that the Knights Templar were told to do when they were uh, supposed to be initiated? They were to renounce uh, Christianity. They were to spit on the cross. They were supposed to kiss the ass of their higher up, whatever it was. You know, give it a little lick or something, whatever it was. And one of the stories in this chapter 6 uh, they have this guy who was initiated into the mysteries of the werewolves, I guess. And one of the things he says, I renounced Christianity, kissed his left hand, which was black and ice cold as that of a corpse. And he had to do this. But again, it goes back to this idea of being initiated by some wizard or maybe a ghoul because he said his hand was cold as a corpse. And... I relate that to the Knights Templar, and the Knights Templar were also accused of sacrificing children and using their fat as an ointment for for what? For magical purposes. So again, we have this idea of blood sacrifices that is linked to Baphomet. We all know. But, and the the work. anointing with oil very specifically tends to be a common theme in sort of initiation rituals. Yeah, uh, and what do they wanna... do? I want to say too with the the moss when you brought up the moss a special moss back to the lichen which is basically a fucking moss right but it's in its own special category it's in its own magical category if you ask me because lichens are very special but they work as the same fucking way as moss they grow with moss like they you know you see lichen and moss likely on the same fucking tree but I, I witnessed my friend she cut her head on a chicken coop like the edge of like the the sheet metal that was on. <laughs> on the chicken coop right and it was like oh shit and but she took the usnia and she made a poultice of it where you put the herb in your mouth and then you put it on the wound she packed it in there overnight i mean it was like the it was a good cut and it, it was all you know healed up and that's what usnia its medical qualities medicinal qualities are for for blood clots and things like that and so you know looking at the moss that's really fucking interesting dude when you talk about the the psychedelic shit but gabe what were you about you were about to share and go deep de deep down on some of this goodness here brother yeah yeah i'm sorry yeah. about that game is that i'm just this is fucking great because it has everything 
It does. Yeah, we are. We're putting it all on the table. Uh, and I'm glad we're back on the anointing because this is a, this was just a, a early in the, in my research, I kind of, you know, did a little deviation, took me into some really interesting places. And uh, so here, I'll share one more. So I, I found, I found the, the, the information and it, I left some things out, which plays a role into what the, this book had a lot of. So we'll, we'll get into that later. All right, nice. So this is an image I just kind of cut and paste these things together. You know, I've known for a while about St. Christopher. <laughs> is, <laughs> this is St. Christopher in some areas, some regions, remote regions. St. Christopher is still depicted with a dog's head. And that <sighs> is that is super profound. And if you look into the story of St. Christopher, uh, he... Uh, the, the 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 mythology or his saintly deed was that he helped a child across a stream, a body of water. He waded across a body of water with this child on his shoulder. And homie, I know you dig that Globus Cruciger right there. I know, uh, dude. I'm, I'm <laughs> you son of a bitch. The, the, the I'm rock hard right now, bro. He's like, <sighs> yeah. Don't make me stand up. I told you I'm not wearing any fucking pants. Okay, can but... I throw out too that he was from a place called Lycia? So we've hey. got that lycan. Oh. Uh, Here we go again. Here we go, y'all. Yes. And what is uh, the word Christ? Christ means the anointed one. So. Uh, are we looking at some of the ingredients to the shape-shifting Jesus mythology? Oh my God, Gabe, dude, that's my favorite Jesus. The shapeshift. The reason that Judas kissed yep. Jesus was because he was a shapeshifter. So, like, You're how are we going to identify him? Let's give him a little, give him a little kiss, and you'll identify him because he was a fucking shapeshifter, dude. You gotta, you gotta Holy taste shit! You got to be able to taste them to tell the difference. You got to right. lick them. Yeah, that's right. the, real, so, the real Jesus has a certain je ne sais quoi. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's kind of like the her monkey of the shit you're talking about earlier. You know, harnessing the power of the you know. Of I'm the telling you, created. it's yeah. part of you know people. People have told me I'm 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 a bit of a homunculologist uh, by now. I have people literally <laughs> messaging me about homunculus. So like, hey, dude, I need some information. I'm like, dude, I'm a guy who has a podcast about weird shit. And uh, did you uh, send me a picture and someone's like, yo, how does this homunculus look to you? It's like, whoa, what the fuck is that? Yeah, bro. Some dude's like, hey, I got a homunculus. I need to know how to take care of him or something like that. I'm like, what the fuck, bro? I, I, I don't even know, man. I just talk about this shit. But the homunculus is linked to a lot of things. It's not just I'm not just bullshitting. And it sounds really cool, but it's linked to a lot of magical practices. Right on. So so this really blew my mind because. Uh, what I discovered, and I think this is really valuable, and uh, and it's hard to say chicken or egg here. I, I don't want to get into that. Um, I'm just going to say all the ingredients are here. I discovered yeah. a, a region in the night sky in the southern hemisphere that includes these three constellations, one on top of the other. One is the great ship of Artigo, which is the ship that Jason and the Argonauts uh, take on, on their adventures. Right next to Argo is this uh, Canis Major, the constellation of Canis Major. The fucking so dog star, baby. So there's the dog. And then right under the dog is Columba. And Columba is the dove. It is symbolic of the tribe, uh, the tribe of David. Uh, and so you put these three, three things together and you get Christopher, the dog saint, Columbus on a ship traveling across a body of water, bringing the Gospels to the New World. So Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, Gabe, hold on, hold on. Okay. Yeah, buddy, yeah, buddy. <laughs> one second. Dude, fuck hold it. on, give me one fuck. I got some on this, fu too. One fucking second, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> it's been one second already, check, dude. Check this, check this, check this out, check this out. <laughs> I have a show, I have a Patreon-only show that I do with Mark from My Family Thinks I'm Crazy and Chris from Mensa. We did a breakdown on Keanu Reeves. Now you brought up the dog star, okay? And there's some shady stuff going on with Keanu Reeves because it was supposedly a sacrifice. Yeah, go. But do go you know <laughs> the name of the band that he was a bass player for? Take a wild fucking guess what the name of the band was. Serious. 
The Dog Star. Oh, The Dog Star. Oh, wait. Is wow. the name of the band. So wow. you're hinting at the possibility that these people are worshiping something far greater. Maybe the dog headed god or something. I don't know what it is, but it's getting kind of weird well, and my nipples are getting kind of hard. The shapeshifter that might even be Christopher Columbus in an episode that we did not too long Saint ago. Saint Germain. Saint yes. Germain, who's a motherfucking deep shapeshifter like this he's been so many different people he's lived so many different lives you know he's said to have had some sort of fountain of you some sort of ponce de leon which i don't know now i'm thinking it's some sort of mercurial moss bath well Just let's let's soak your nuts in some moss let's go ahead and finish because this plays a part into what goes on later in the book which I don't know if Thomas is going to use this for his Adrenochrome well, book. Well, I wanted to I wanted to jump off a couple of things because uh, Gabe took the serious consolation. Just a couple, away, but <laughs> just a couple. But I mean, uh, Gabe loves wordplay, so I've got a few that you can soak on if you haven't already. So you you had the constellation of Sirius up there, and if you know that Sirius B uh, is claimed to be one of these like ancient astronaut theories that the Dogon tribe uh, in West Africa had this you know ancient knowledge of kind of star people and there's also i had to look this up because i i wanted to make sure i wasn't wrong about this but there's a japanese version of ancient astronauts called the dogu um <laughs> oh, and, shit. and neither of those directly translate to like canine dog but in the words that are pronounced you know the phonetically they both have you know doggone tribe dogu um mm -hmm. you know serious serious <laughs> b in the system of the doggone tribe so uh, I'm seeing a lot of different dogs, you know, barking Damn. here, man. That's fucking awesome. Thank you for that, the fucking dogu. Wow. In, Have and, you never heard uh, about that? It's the Japanese version of the ancient astronaut. Wow, that's fucking Nuts. crazy. And, yeah. and let's point out, let's point out while we're at it, the dog in reverse is God. You know? Yes. And yeah. that's what that's Very what the well, isn't there some weird Freemasonic connection to the dog with uh, with with that on there? Because again, because God. They're, they're, Osiris. See, it's Osiris. Every time we get too close, it's Osiris yeah. worship because he you was see. worshipped as the. Because you have Isis, the Isis cult, right? And then what's what's the the latter half of that is the Osiris worship. You know, the Masons fucking worship the ancient Egyptians, like right? Is so, yeah. sorry to speak upon the the half of them uh, as we have Thomas here, but I'm pretty sure they'd be getting down on some pyramids, bro. Yeah, they'd be getting down and weird, bro. They'd be doing some weird shit, tying each other up, fucking touching their butts together. It's some weird shit. Bro. Hey, that's the Shriners, bro. Come on, man. All right, I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. So here, I got one more that's quick awesome. share to just kind of... Uh, uh oh Oh, here we go. Okay, I got one more to kind of bring that whole, con that whole idea to some degree of closure. So this is an old weave that I've uh, done before, but it's just fun because this project we did here is bringing a whole new level of meaning and context and value to, you know, ideas I already had. So up top you have uh, Canis Major, the Columbia, the Columba, uh, or Columbia, and Argus. You put them together, as I pointed out, you get that Christopher Columbus. Uh, but then to kind of weave it in with what uh, uh, Homie Romy was saying about Anubis uh, being venerated or uh, worshipped in Egypt. Uh, a long time ago, I discovered that the letters, your standard uh, single reduction ordinal gematria uh, for Anubis is a perfect correspondence to the exact same letters come out in the name Saturn. So you can see here, 155291, you get 112595. It's the same numbers, just in a different order. Uh, so I thought I would just throw that together, that this whole worshiping mm -hmm. of the dog is uh, very much uh, indicating worshiping of the underworld, of this Anubis, this Mercury who brings you to the other side, and the potential for the fact that Saturn might have once sat at the North Pole. And I just want to put that chariot card, which is Cancer, the chariot card has intrinsic to it. It has chimeras. It has these uh, men shaped as beasts uh, are kind of integral to the chariot card up there at the mm -hmm. top of the zodiac. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share all that uh, because it does. It pertains to what we're doing here. And it's really awesome to have found Christopher Columbus and the possibility of uh, 
you know, him being Anubis like, very Anubis like. And Osiris is linked to the moon too, right? So Osiris is linked to the moon and the worship of the moon and this lycanthropy crossover with the full moon. Well, like the full Osiris worship, we got Osiris worship going on and they're paying homage. Anubis is the son of Osiris in st some stories, in other stories, and actually more stories than not, as he's actually the son of Set. Uh, which right. is Osiris's brother, but Osiris's brother are set on Osiris just the same thing. Did he tear himself into pieces, right? Maybe, and you know, as he went on a lycanthropic, you know, adventure, like who knows? Is it the classic story and, of he and, and killed one, himself? He was his own twin. One thing I want to add to this idea of tearing apart. Uh, one of the things, one of the themes that I saw in this book was that certain werewolves only tore apart women and not men. And they had some sort of, uh, they preferred to tear up and mutilate women's bodies versus men. So I don't know, that that's like kind of like an inversion, I guess, on the story too, where did he break his own body up? And then we all know the, the rest of the story with that. But I just woman, thought it was interesting. So, so you got to have this, the nuts for the cats, ladies. So, so this card, this is uh, the, Th the Thoth deck uh, moon card. And one thing I just want to point out, you know, the dogs of war is a very old term. And uh, I just want to bring to people's mind that, you know, it's very likely that is what the actual Dow Jones is really all about. The oh, deal. shit. The D-O-W, the dogs of war of the, Do of the Dow Jones. Oh, those fools, those are the real secret keepers. You know, those are the guys who are benefiting from all the signaling and steganographic communication and public purview. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out too, you know, this is definitely uh, very sacred knowledge and it's fun to share it and, you know, have a little peek of what it really means. And I want to give Mario a huge thanks for pointing out that Sirius is rising today. The rising Bro, you of- think I picked, You think I picked this date because, just because, dude? Come on, man, come on. <laughs> You know all about this shit. Fucking homie Romy sacrificing chickens and putting his feet in the blood of the chicken. My mic's fucked up. Why do you think it's fucked up? Homie Romy messed it up, bro. Yo, the mechanic, Energy, told me, the mechanic told me today I need a brand new engine on my Volvo. So that's uh, another a piece. On your, vol on your Volvo? My Volvo. <laughs> yeah. My Volvo needs a new engine. Hey, um, <laughs> I actually got to go in 10 minutes because I have a shift. You're this evening. fucking lame, bro. Oh, I okay. Know, hold on. I got, I got one yeah. more thing I want to drop before you yes, leave. Homie. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please. Okay. So just from chapter one, uh, or maybe, uh, excuse me, chapter two, uh, you know, getting my ears around the word, um, the Norse term of Ulf, you know, they've got Ulf is means wolf. And that just opened my mind to so many ideas and so many concepts. Um, you know, um, so Rome was founded by a couple of uh, brothers who were raised by a wolf. The yeah. Bellamy salute, the old, you know, the old Bellamy salute is the Roman salute. That's the mm -hmm. same. It's uh, They used to do it with their hand turned upward as though they were holding up the, the uh, body of Saturn in their hand and admiring it. Well, the uh, Nazis flipped the Bellamy salute this way. And what will make a lot of people uncomfortable, a lot of our elders will not appreciate knowing this, but in America, when they did the, uh, or the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, up until 1942, the <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance up. looked like this. And in 1942, not a good look, not, a good, not look. a good look, man, not a good look. So we're that close. We're that far away. It hasn't even been 100 years yet. It's only 80 years ago that we changed our Hail Hitler Roman salute to the flag of America. We changed it to something different. And so that's something to really think about. And so now I'm thinking about the name Adolf, Adolf Hitler. He, his name has that phonetic trigger going Wolf. back to the wolves and the Wolf. dogs. What's Wolf. that What's that one game? Wolfstein. Wolf. And it's Wolf. about fucking zombie Nazis, bro. Right. And, that's, and there's a sacrament. The stein is a cup. The stein is a stone. It's a cup full of precious stones from mm -hmm. Revelation. You mm -hmm. partake of this uh, sacrament. You change into a wolf. You're initiated. Yep. 
Yep. So I got, uh, well, I, I'll just run through this since you got to go, homie. Uh, I'm also thinking about the name Jeff Dalmer. Is it, is so another, uh, well, here, no, I'll bring it up so people can see the spelling because it sounds like a stretch phonetically. Fucking once you send it. Yeah, once you see the spelling here, I got her. I got her pulled up. Ulfhammer. Ulfhammer. Is, was Jeff Dahmer an Ulfhammer? He liked eating people. I mean, he liked eating people. There, It's in there. You know, there are some phonetic sounds and names that are probably real bad ideas to name your kids. Uh, so this is maybe a sound that you may want to yeah. avoid naming your child. Uh, because it is uh, strangely supercharged in up uh, in the collective. Archetypes, Sorry. man. The name archetypes. I'm big, big on that. Dude. Word magic. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. And then if that was too much of a stretch for people, now I'm now reassessing the t the word olfactory. Your olfactory sense is your wolf actory sense. It's your sense of smell. And so That's I go dope. online. That's super dope. I like that. Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. And I go online and I look up olfactory and it's got this strange picture on just, you know, we keep idea. It, a very first page, they have a picture of an old lady smelling a carnation and she's got a puppy in her arms. And it's like somebody knows that this twilight language has that wolf uh aspect to the word for, old factory so i thought i would travel just... too you know like that like you brought up the vehicle you know like that's a and chariot card comes up a lot yeah you yeah. think about like and i i've had i have i would like to actually throw this out and see what you guys think on this there's this you know the theory that the original i don't even know if it's a theory but the original highways were built by freemasons right to connect these different lodges those were like the original main roads you know, uh, through these different cities to have quick access to the places that the people that needed to go places went, right? People that needed to be on the fucking roads back in the day. Um, and so there's that just like that need, that necessity to quickly travel places to to go somewhere very fast. You know, a reason for lycanthropy would be to run fucking everywhere all night. You yep. have the urge in the sense to just run. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just like, ah, oh, got that fucking run like and a so, berserker right like a berserker like a would berserker. great call hop in the pool and fucking do that and so yeah car the chariot card brought you brought up earlier and the moon and like you know what's transformers all about bro they're all about that shit too whipping in the cars dude and that's I, inevitably cars. i think the story folds in on itself you know we are gonna find ourselves going faster places faster and faster um you know and using this fucking the, the celestial fucking growth of the planet to do so um <clears throat> but i dude i've been digging this dude this is amazing uh i hope you guys continue to crush it uh and it's been a blessing as always i want to share one final one final weave that um that i absolutely uh i enjoy here uh so hold up here let's go let's go open this shit up come on you dirty oh, hoe bro Bro, okay. Go, look at all okay. Those tabs. John fucking Candy going berserk. Okay, nice going berserker. John Candy. I'm already interested. You had, you had me at John Candy. <laughs> as Barf. Oh, shit. Barf. Another nice, fucker. Dude. The werewolf. Oh, Think shit. about this, dude. How <laughs> how is it that he plays not only a, a space werewolf but also plays in a movie titled berserk going berserk space balls space, space balls, balls. Exactly. Fucking so oh. uh, that was just a fun one that was a fun he's one his, uh, he's his own best friend that's fucking awesome <laughs> and it's can canine candy john candy he's got the Dude. canine and he, so not, the real reason I went down the candy rabbit hole the other day was like, okay, so this is John Candy. He's the the ever America's favorite uncle, and he's the John John Candy, candy. gives the candy to all the little uh, kids, you know, because he's a fucking werewolf and a berserker who's like eating these children. So he's like, I got candy. Who wants to come hang out with the John candy? And then, you know, it gives them the candy. They never come back. You know, you got yourself some sort of Michael Jackson thriller situation. Um, 
and yeah man you know that's the, that's the crazy shit about hollywood baby you know hey i i don't make the news baby you know i'm just out here reporting it you feel me uh, just kidding let me read this one last thing and i swear to god i'm fucking done okay uh when gabe brought up uh midsummer's night dream earlier shakespeare right the baconian ciphers and all that shit shakespeare did write about werewolves uh and it kind of ties into the irish connection we were talking about earlier uh the inspiration for shakespeare's irish wolves is apparently a 13th century latin text of wonders of ireland which drew upon an 11th century celtic poem it speaks of strange irish phenomenon such as ships floating in the air included in this phenomenon are tales of irish wolves or people given over to lycanthropy or werewolfism. The Latin text describes a very civilized species of Irish werewolves. They separate from their human body, which they ask their friends to carefully guard because if their bodies are moved in the slightest, the Irish wolf can never return to human form. Then when re-embodied, the werewolves go off to sheep to eat sheep and not humans. Intriguingly, the wonders of Ireland had been inspired by Shakespeare's wolves, quoted by Montag Summers over 300 years later in a study of the werewolf, <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. But it just is, it, it's all connects, bro. So I got a, oh, I got oh, a oh. video that I was supposed to play at the, as an intro. Uh, some fucking weirdos I found on the internet. Maybe I, I might just play it now so you guys can watch and then homie Romy, I, I guess, has to go. But I just wanted to laugh at these people a little bit. So. <laughs> I made this little clip. Perfect. Can you guys hear this? Yes, yes. All right. Hi. Hi. Are you comfortable? Oh, yeah. Thanks. So you are not a werewolf. No. But your husband is a werewolf. Yes. What's it like to be married to a werewolf? Well, it's challenging, but it's really just getting used to living on a strict schedule. <laughs> kind of like being married to a guy in the National Guard. National I'm on my own. <laughs> Are you worried about your child? Well, who wouldn't be worried? But uh, that's just baby stuff, not werewolf stuff. Does the baby move differently during a full moon? Oh, no. No, the baby's completely normal. When a child of a lycanthrope father is born, their first change doesn't even come until puberty. How are you preparing for the fact that your child will grow up and become a werewolf? I'm very concerned about it. <laughs> but really more about how we'll keep his secret. As far as his first change goes, he'll have his dad to guide him through it. And it'll actually be a nice father-son kind of thing. What the fuck? Do you guys These have lines a are so fucking rehearsed, yeah, bro. Yeah, there. Bro, so it continues. Let it continue. And apparently the, the this cadence is cadence is just someone that's like memorized lines. Check, but check this: the Werewolf's Guide to Life, a manual for the newly bitten. So if you guys want to check that website, I didn't check it out. I just found this clip. Oh, so this, nice. but this is like a joke, though. They're not presenting this as like a thing. It's still fucking funny, bro. <laughs> and then I got <laughs> camera, this a mystery in Texas. What is this strange figure that people are trying to figure out? Yeah, so there's aliens now. There's monkeypox. What about Wolfman? Yeah, this is really, you guys, sometimes this job is just too much. It's trying me today. Here's some video, though. <laughs> this one? Oh. Yo, Romy, is that you, bro? Yeah, it's trying me. This okay. is from Amarillo, Texas, Amarillo, Texas. It shows an unknown figure walking around a perimeter fence at the Amarillo Zoo. The creature is wolf-like, I guess. It, to me, it sort of looks like the Sonic before they, you know, had to fix it. But anyway, it was spotted at around 1 a.m. I'm going to bring up the, um, the father, I guess, uh, of the... Right here, this guy right here. This is the fucking weird I want you guys to see. <laughs> How did you feel afterward? How did I feel? How do you think I felt? I just killed a teenage boy. Did you think I, I grew up thinking, oh, maybe someday I'll tear apart some kid with my own claws. I'll chew on his innards with my own teeth. It was a dream come friggin' true. That's what it was. <laughs> You know, the next day, I found his forearm in my garage. I must have brought it back after killing him and stowed it there. Like a little doggy bag. Teenage boy leftovers. So I felt aces. Aces. Do you have advice for other werewolves to make sure this doesn't happen to them? Yeah, I have some advice. Don't get loose. 
That's my advice. Damn, y'all. Let me look up this website real quick. Hold on, and I'll pull it up. Anyways, werewolfguidetolife.com. Wow. That <laughs> Dude, is there, were a couple, there were a couple terms in there that were kind of military. You know? But, uh, I felt aces. Uh, something the wife yeah. said. It's all about scheduling. Is it? Kind of, there was some military shit going on in there. Well, she said that, that it was like having a husband that was in the National Guard, I think. That's like it. That. Dog tags, dude. You got to go. So as soon as I pulled this, tags, as soon as I pulled this this website up, uh, fucking dog started barking outside. Oh, <laughs> nice. All right, I really got to go because my thing starts in a half hour. So much All right, love, homie, homie. Until next time, y'all. Big love, brother. Oh, he, he's leaving all the good bits out, man. He's leaving us to all the good bits towards yeah. the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What a fucking asshole, bro. <laughs> um. <laughs> so picking up on the dog tags, uh, there's a there. This is something that maybe someday we can expand out on. But somebody mentioned, I don't know who it was. Somebody in our in our greater circle, but somebody mentioned that. Uh, Many of the president's dogs are named after the corresponding drug lord of that time. <laughs> and, that, and that there's been like uh, multiple uh, presidents who their dog publicly in front of everybody has the same name as the drug lord down in whatever, South America or overseas somewhere. And that would be really trippy to see, like, you know, it only takes four or five hits to be like, well, there's a pattern there, you know. I know that uh, Bush Sr., his dog's name was Sully. And that kind of hits an interesting correspondence, uh, be it coincidence or more than that, because Bush Sr. was responsible for the planes crashing, and Sully was a famous pilot who saved a bunch of people in a from a plane crash? Uh, Sully, movie Tom Hanks did, where he lands in the Hudson and saves everybody, saves everybody, and that's just an interesting uh, tie-in there. That we do see a pattern there potentially, but I'd like to hear a little more on the idea that the the president is uh, pointing out that his dog, his bitch, is the leader of a drug empire that's really you say uh, that too and uh and bill clinton's dog when clinton was in office his dog's name was buddy and barry seal was the cia pilot that was trafficking through cocaine um through mina arkansas which bill clinton was directly involved in and barry oh. seal's brother's name was guess what it fucking was <laughs> buddy. buddy so the the brother of barry seal which was like one of the the crucial you know points of that Mina sort of we're talking about Iran Contra essentially yeah. again like I, I never heard that before but sure enough Buddy was named after uh, a direct part in that. See, there's something. That's the there. first time I hear about that. That's really interesting. Uh, that then not the that the president's dogs were named after. It's almost like encapsulating the the and what do they call the people who smuggle people in they call them coyotes right it's like oh uh, nice so again that canine or 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 dog like type of thing yep. and <laughs> and um reagan had a dog named lucky and didn't reagan sell uh, i guess he sold winchesters but winchesters and lucky cigarettes uh, you could say that he was peddling his own drugs too through his dog's name. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, th those are interesting names. Like they're they're too cutesy wootsy, you know. They're they're just open enough to interpret that there might be some kind of nod and a wink on those dogs' names. So or, or a hood and a wink. <laughs> I wanted to point out there there was a lot of killing. There was a lot of cannibalism. There was a lot of that and. One of the things that stood out to me in chapter 8 was the father. There was a father who was a werewolf, and he was eating his daughters. He was literally killing and eating his daughters and until one of them was able to throw him down into the pit that he had dug, that he had made them dig. So that was that. And then this is where Thomas might want to leave because there's a story about a Freemasonic leader of a lodge that had figured out the powers of 
transformation, I guess. And they talk about him have uh, him being able to shapeshift as a werewolf and having the head of a uh, you know you have the dog's heads as well and it made me really think about Yale's wolf's head secret society what if these people are literally dressing up as wolves right because the the garments the 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 pelt of this animal there are various um, ways that people can transform and one of the things that that they talk about metempsychosis. Pythagoras talked about that, where your your soul can uh, travel from body to body, and there are various forms of how a person can transform into a werewolf. But if your if your soul is leaving your body and going into the werewolf, that would mean that there's werewolves sitting around somewhere, or is it like some sort of astral type of thing? Because your body is there you know what i mean and this plays into talismanic magic where when you are astral traveling you need to get a watcher a watcher to watch over your body while you're out doing fuckery in the astral realm so that nothing else can take over your body well this is like it, when your friend goes out and like stands in the parking spot while you go in like it's like a designated TV. driver yeah <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much to watch over you and so i was like so if they're transferring their consciousness to this werewolf, that would mean that there's werewolves. Where where would they? Where would the body be? You know what I mean? It makes me think of yeah. Skinwalker Ranch, where they've seen werewolves there to, uh, eating the cattle, and they're bulletproof. People shoot at them, and they're almost magical, where they don't even die or anything like that. So, nice. very well, very interesting. One one thing on that is it adheres to a, a magical principle uh, of principle of physics but it's the law of equivalent exchange and that's why that just kind of rings uh strangely true you know it is adhering to some of the foundational principles so i really dig that uh that there's different ways to explain it but it's still observed you know and and also the the yale's wolfhead secret society is tied to the Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller and Henry Flagler because and John D. Because the Harkness, the Harkness, Deborah Harkness was one of the ones that translated a bunch of Don, John D.'s work and she's written books on him. Harkness was Henry Flagler's one of his wives and also his stepbrother was a Harkness. And they were in the shadows. They were uh, they were silent investors. So again, plays Harkness, darkness. So I mean, they're in the shadows plays a role into this and one of Harkness's the original Harkness's stepsons I believe or one of his sons was the one that uh, donated a, a new tomb to the Wolf's Head Society and we know that they have the Wolf's Head they have the what is it scroll and key and then they have the famous skull and bones which we all know and love you know talking about the bushes and all that good stuff but again, there's this idea that I do believe that these guys are either, uh, what's the whole thing at the Bohemian Grove? They run around naked and they do these weird ceremonies. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that these people are dressing up as werewolves and maybe howling at the moon with their boys and maybe jerking off at the same time. Who the fuck knows, you know? As you do. <laughs> and I, I want to mention too, in, in chapter eight, I had uh, just a few takeaway notes that i found really interesting one of them was that in chapter eight by the way was about general folklore that they hadn't directly addressed in one of the previous chapters and one of the cool things that they mentioned is that one of the folklore stories that the way that you became a werewolf and the way that you obtained this potion that in previous chapters came from a wizard and from like these special concoctions but uh this one was that you waited for a wolf's paw print to be left in clay and when rain would drip into that paw print, if you drank yeah. the water from the paw print, that was the magical potion that could turn you into mm -hmm. a werewolf. I thought that was so freaking cool. There was another one that said that mm -hmm. in uh, Polish culture that the Poles, they kind of turned into werewolves two different times of the year. And it was almost like a berserker reference that they just turned into these like insatiable werewolf beast creatures and it happened in, in the book he says at christmas and midsummer but i mean as soon as you say christmas and midsummer like, yeah we're, we're talking uh again about you know some very occult 
sort of initiation rites that happen at two distinct parts of the year. And then yes. the, the third one was uh, they actually start talking about. Oh, they got him. And uh, I thought that one was probably the coolest part, and I wouldn't want anyone <laughs> to miss out on that. That was fucking. Bro, it was like the secret of life just revealed in a chapter. Don't miss out on that one, man. Yeah, you guys are gonna have to find that. Like how when Royce went up to Crowley and was like, "Yo, you put the secret out," and what poem? And we don't know which poem it was, but he put the secret, all the secret mysteries out. I think it was Royce that went up to him. Anyways. Uh, in that same ch in chapter eight, uh, after the wolf's head, there was a woman eater known as Dog's Head or Wolf's Head too, as well. That's that's also another Wolf's Head uh, reference. He was a woman eater. He was killing all these women, and you know Wolf's Head secret society. I don't know if there's a connection there. And really, a lot of the book after this is a lot of account of cannibalism. There was also, and I don't know if you really picked up on this or not, uh, Thomas, the lady that would bathe in the blood of people. And how yeah, well, she... well, there was a natural progression because in chapter nine, he mentions that at this point, the concept of being a werewolf, it used to be directly tied to like either cannibalism or it was tied to some sort of punishment or mythology or mm -hmm. um, some kind of like sacred right. It always had some other connection with a thing. But then at some point, it just became its own thing. Like, you could just be a werewolf separated from all these other factors. Like, so you mean that could eat people without having to be a fucking werewolf? Right well, on, well, at this, but that, at the same exact point where it kind of forks, um, they mentioned that in the Middle Ages, lycanthropy becomes diagnosed as, like, I guess, a disease. So you could actually come down with a bout of lycanthropy to explain away... You know, the fact that you've got these 20 dead bodies in, in the back or or whatever, like that taste for flesh that you've got, it was actually looked at as a disease that could perhaps be cured or have. And then they also this was this one was really cool to me because in the, the in the um, medieval ages, they're mentioning that one of the signs of being a werewolf and they describe kind of sadism and, and you know, psychopathy like. You were mentioning before um, the the cannibalist uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, right? Like a lot of, if you look at his original story, it was like torturing animals as a small kid, um, just being like a sadistic person, just like um, like kind of mentally tormenting people and physically tormenting people, and it kind of kept evolving, evolving until it turned into this cannibalism. Well, again, they're mentioning in, in chapter nine. This was titled "Natural Causes of Lycanthropy," and one of those natural things that you could say like. Hey, that kid's probably going to turn into a fucking werewolf because he's been like torturing small animals and stuff. So there was a distinction somewhere. And I think there might be a, a link between, you know, serial killers and werewolves. And maybe back in the day, it was just you kind of all mixed so. together because there was also a <laughs> reference in an earlier chapter that the word for wolf uh, by the, Ang the early Anglo-Saxons had a double meaning for. Uh, I believe it was like um, an outlaw. So if you were an outlaw or if you had been cast out by general society, you were essentially called the same name as a wolf, a beast, uh, because they would say you would drive the wolves out as far as you could from society. So, again, you've got this these criminals, these serial killers, these, you know, cannibals all being tied into the one beast of a wolf. I just found that really fascinating. Well, nice. it, it plays into also the, right, you're talking about the wolves, the shepherd and his flock, right? What is he trying to, or what do you, whatever you call his herd, but what is he trying to do? He's trying to keep away the wolves. You always hear wolf in sheep's clothing where somebody's a shape, literally shape-shifting, right? A sheep, doesn't it say in the Bible, we are the sheep of the, the, of the he's herding us or something like that, you know? Yeah. So... Uh, so some people can shape you know what i mean like it's it's a weird it's weird language to use and that's what really gets me these people yeah. know that conspiracies exist and then you have biden talking about the new world order and on tv it's come on, yeah. pick the right language, every president has said new world order at some point <laughs> I think. they need Good to point. so uh one thing about the shape shifting uh you know we uh over on the spiders we've coined this term uh you know because all of zeus's mythology involves him taking on whatever form he needs to to get with his uh his to get uh, it in to get it in. he had an obvious kink bro and it did not involve the human form it was <laughs> role-playing
Right. So, you know, he's like the Swiss army knife of fucking rapists. <laughs> You get the little corkscrew part out, right? Like a duck. <laughs> he had it all. He had it all. Now, this is actually cosmologically uh, impeccable because Jupiter has a very nifty pattern. It has an 11-year orbit. It takes 11 years to go through its entire uh, uh, rotation, orbital plane. And in that time... 11. Much, yep. Yeah, much like a shepherd... He is spending an equal portion of time with each of the animals of the zodiac. The zodiac. He's shepherding the animals and keeping them in their exact place. And he's doing it like clockwork. So we coined this term. We now call it crypto Zeusology because Zeus is able to shift into whatever animal he needs to uh, become. And so what happens with that is the mythology is telling you the time of year. The animal that he becomes corresponds with the time of year, with the seasonal that shift. That makes sense. Yes. So that's a, that's a real keystone to interpreting mythology, is knowing that Zeus is much like a good shepherd, and he's going on and keeping all the animals in their paddock. Uh, and what's really interesting is that just interior – to Zeus's orbital uh, cycle, just on the inside, before you get to Mars, there's actually a, a wall. A, you could think of it as a cobblestone wall, and that's the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is much like the uh, shepherd's paddock, keeping all of the signs and symbols in their exact perfect place. So I just wanted to kind of bring that uh, crypto-Zeusology to the table and the shape-shifting of Zeus uh, because it is uh, ast astro theology at its finest. It it really, fun. yeah, it's telling a story, the story in the sky, and that's how people were because of rhetoric they were able to to remember it more easily. And yeah. this idea that again we have a master. I have uh, a a chapter seven, I believe, something I was just flipping through here. Uh, it's a werewolf telling these little girls how he got his power. Right, and he tells him, "Oh, my master gave me this power, and I got it from my master. He's the one that can do it. He can do it way better than I can." And he goes, "Do you want to know who Pierre Laborant, uh, who, who he is? Well, look at there, there uh, goes Thomas. Uh, hey, he is a man with an iron chain about his neck, which he is ever engaged in gnawing. Do you want to know where he lives, lass? Ha! Huh, in a place of gloom and fire, where there are many companions, some seated on iron chairs, burning." Burning others stretched on glowing beds, burning too. Some cast men upon blazing coals, others roast men before fierce flames. So he's talking about the fucking devil gave him this power. You know what I mean? He's describing where his master lives, this the master of nature. Right? You have Pan, this 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 thing in in nature, Soronos, right? The stag headed god where he walks around and and uh, this is a story about Jean Grenier, I guess. Uh, again, it's, it's had a bunch of different stories, and it's all related. And what Thomas was saying, it gets to the point where it separates the two, and it's like this is just stories of cannibalism, this is just stories of necromancers, this is a story of a lady who would bathe in the in the blood of of dead women, uh, dead uh, girls, children, and. I don't know if he's going to use that for his adrenochrome book, but it made sense where the these elites. And I brought up this idea back then that people, there was medicinal cannibalism. And this was a real thing during medieval times. And people eat mummy dust in Egypt. There are people who eat gold as well, and it's supposed to help with the digestive system. But I brought this idea up on some, uh, some Twitter thread, and somebody wrote back to me, they're like, nobody was eating people in the medieval times or some shit. I'm like, dude, fucking do the research, brothers. Been, you know, this ultimate taboo has been around for a very, very long time. And necromancy, we know it. Uh, to, to close this part out with uh, the necromancy and the digging up of, of graves, because this also plays a role into the werewolf aspect. There's some werewolves that would dig up graves and eat the rotten corpses of these people. 
Uh, so we have grave robbing, we have necromancy, we have cannibalism, we have all the good stuff. Uh, to Back to that ointment that I was talking about that Paracelsus made. The alchemist Paracelsus advocated a weapon salve treatment that his uh, critics considered to be nothing short of witchcraft. According, This is what I had brought up earlier. According to Paracelsus, wounds suffered in battle should be treated with a magical ointment applied both to the wound and to the weapon that caused the injury. But this is where it got me because, again, we're talking about digging up graves and doing all this stuff. Paracelsus' ointment formula called for two ounces of moss taken from a buried skull, a half ounce of embalmed human flesh, embalmed, two ounces of human fat, two drams of linseed oil, and one ounce each of roses and bull aromanac, a type of acidic earth. The physician was to mix all these ingredients together and add blood of the patient, so we have the blood aspect of it, the wound would then be cleaned and treated with the ointment. It would be bound with bandages dipped in the patient's urine. A Paracelsus also said that the ointment should be smeared on the weapon that caused the injury. It was sympathetic magic in his uh, detractors. A Paracelsus said that a mystical process of animal magnetism would draw on the sympathetic life spirit that flowed between the wound and the weapon. Uh, Paracelsus was defended by the English physician and alchemist Robert Flood who said that the cure is done by the mag magnetic power of the salve caused by the stars, which by the meditation of the air is carried and adjoined to the wound. So again, alchemy and green language more than likely. Paracelsus ointment was also in use for a period of time and then disappeared. So, and we have various other 17th century alchemists using the ointment, but I found it weird that it was from the skull of a, of a body, plus you have the blood, and you have other things in there, and that was used to cure wounds. Now, it's Paracelsus, the father of toxicology. For those that don't know, this guy is the guy that said, what's the, how do you say it, Thomas? The dose is the... The dose is, is the cure. The dose is the cure. It's like it either kills you or it fucking does he, he was the one that realized, <laughs> I mean, in very oversimplistic terms, he's the one that realized that everyone would be afraid of, you know, some kind of plant because if you ate a whole bunch of it, you would die. And he realized that, yeah, but if you just eat a tiny little bit, that could end up being the cure for something. And that he applied that through all kind of, and, when, and there's still people that do that today. I, I don't know if it's called like holistic medicine or something. Some of it gets into BS territory, but the concept is that you can take something that's potent and then make it like one per 1,000 parts of water and just drink that tiny little diluted version of it and get either just as much benefit or even more benefit uh, because of the dilution. I don't personally believe in that aspect of it, but that essentially is what we're talking about of Paracelsus. Like he's the one that originated that entire concept that mm -hmm. like, you know, a, a teaspoon is different and it affects you differently than taking like a whole freaking, uh, you know, gallon of it or something. It's amazing how how old this information, these techniques, this technology is. You know, it, it blows me away to hear Paracelsus talking about sympathetic magic or, well, sympathetic science. Uh, which he was practical, is, bro. Like he was doing it in real life. You know, this wasn't mm -hmm. theoretical for him. Big time, yeah. One of my favorite uh, uh, aspects of sympathetic magic. This is just a fun lesson, and mo a lot of people have already heard this story. But there's a there's a fun twilight reveal behind this story. It's the uh, <clears throat> the myth that Crowley was walking in a busy city next to one of his homies. Maybe you know, maybe Rockefeller. Who knows? Some some Wall Street bigwig. And this guy's a materialist walking with Crowley, you know, the fucking beast himself. And he's like, hey, man, right here and right now, no warning whatsoever. Make me a believer. Show me something in front of all these people. Show me something. Crowley looks around. He's like, give me your hat. He's like, what? He said, give me your hat. Everybody in those, in those days, they were all wearing the same fucking Abraham Lincoln top hat. So the guy gives him his hat. Crowley puts the hat on. And he starts to focus on a man who's walking just five steps ahead of Crowley, walking down the street with him in the same direction. And they're behind this fella. So this fella has no idea what's going on. And Crowley starts to embody the body language of this fella. And he's stepping in the same exact spots. And he's making himself 
uh, imbued with the energy of this man who's unaware that this is happening. And after a few steps, and he's got the same exact gait, and when the man looks to the one direction, Crowley waits till he's in that footstep, and he looks in the same direction that that man looked. And then a couple steps later, Crowley stumbles down to one knee and falls. And sure enough, the man ahead of them stumbles and falls in the exact same fashion that Crowley fell in. And the man who asked for this trick was an instant convert immediately. And now I want to reveal that that is same path I take magic. You're putting yourself in the other man's shoes. It's the same path I take magic, sympathetic magic. That's why he needed the hat. He needed something that uh, is imbued with the spirit of the other person. And it was just enough to wear the same hat that the other fellow was wearing. So that's a fun story to kind of uh, put that term, sympathetic, uh, in very interesting context because it is powerful. It's still powerful. Uh, Sympath oh, sorry, uh, finish up. Okay. Fuck Crowley anyway. <laughs> yeah, fu fuck that asshole. Sympathetic magic is exerted at a distance through association that establishes a connection for the flow of power. One of the best known sympathetic magic tools is the puppet, a doll that substitutes for a person. The connection is strength by, strengthened by attaching to the doll photographs, hair, or personal objects. So we're talking about voodoo and shit. Anything can be used to establish a sympathetic connection. The best items, da da da. I'm not going to read that. Uh, and I found this interesting. Australian Aborigines put sharp pebbles or ground glass in the footprints of enemies as sympathetic magic to weaken and destroy them. So we have different forms of magic. And you could also say that. That's why I don't, so, uh, Ruel says this, but that's the reason I don't eat food from other people that they give me. Like, if I, if I know somebody, well, I do it with Hispanic people, because they, again, Santeria and all this stuff, uh, what you'll have women do is they'll take meat and they'll put their period blood on it to put a spell on you or something. So, usually when I'm offered, <laughs> that sounds racist, but from another Hispanic person, and I'm Hispanic, uh, the they try and give me food or something. I usually deny it or I take it. It's not to be rooted, but I don't eat it. I throw it out. There's so, the same reason I don't eat at Subway. <laughs> but you're watching them make your shit right there, so that's a little bit different. I know it's, that's why it's even more offensive, bro. Like I saw you do that. You just scratch your balls and touch my sandwich. What the <laughs> fuck's wrong with you? Uh, I was gonna say something else, and I completely forgot. Thank you, well, Thomas. I, I, I got something. For. I got something to really uh, bring home the power of that voodoo doll that, you know, that simulacrum, the similarity of the likeness of you being used to manipulate you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's what your driver's license is. Your driver's license is a fucking voodoo doll of you. And it doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. is the, this is the straw man. A straw man is a voodoo doll. And well, they take a pin... And they stick it with pins and they put marks on your name, and now you got to fucking comply. You're compelled. Uh, it brings me to two points. I remembered what I was going to say because I've heard uh, thought is circular, so it always comes back around. But the idea of psychic vampires. So I do 100% believe in that. And I actually do, maybe for the next one, have a book uh, on psychic vampires that we could probably get into. Uh, doing the whole werewolf thing. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we'll save it for later. But this idea of psychic vampires. And also the idea, and I completely forgot again, god damn it. And I'm not even stoned right now, so I don't even know why That's uh, problem. I, keep, I keep forgetting. <laughs> something about voodoo dolls? Uh, I completely forgot. So, Oh, uh, yes. The, the indigenous people, they didn't like their picture taken. Because they had some superstitious belief that their soul was captured at that point in time by that picture and it would live on forever in that point in time because of that picture that was taken so, and again you have your id which is what a picture of you that you carry around and according to their beliefs that's you you're trapped in that picture for the rest of time there is no taking it back they stole your soul for that one picture and when you use your id for everything I mean, your passport to be able to travel in and out of again imaginary places imaginary borders that we didn't put there that man put there animals don't give a shit about your border they're gonna go right across your border 
and walk right past it. They don't care. It's all intrinsic value, and it's how uh, I think it was an Epictetus quote or something. I'll pull it up now, but it's the simulacrum. Yeah, let me pull up the quote. The, the simulacrum is never what hides the truth. It is the truth that hides the fact that there is none. The simulacrum is true. And that's uh, Ecclesiastes. And this idea that they, in society, right, we're uh, back to this whole thing of seeing a facade over something, the illusion that there's something there. A lot of the times we're just seeing a facade of something that's actually not there, but we give that facade value over everything else. And that's what money is. The number one rule in magic and money, the monetary system, is faith. Believing that tomorrow it's not going to crumble and be worth nothing. Because essentially there is nothing holding it up except the belief of others. It's an egregore that's lived on for forever. So again, it's all. I think it always goes back to the occult for me. And mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting. And speaking of the occult, one of the chapters that stood out to me was actually two chapters. I was reading it and I'm trying to figure out who the fuck they're talking about. And they talk about, and I hope, I, I don't know if I'm saying it right. <clears throat> Guillez de Retz, right? I've never Googled how to say his name or anything, but either way, this was Joan of Arc's right hand man. Okay. We know Joan of Arc was talking to angels, right? She was, she was a schizophrenic. We had Joe Rogan recently, he had Strassman on, and they were talking about DMT, and they were talking about how they link schizophrenia to a lung disease, because they were talking about different parts of the body that produce DMT, so they were trying to allegedly find a way to suppress the DMT production, and that's what they thought was wrong with schizophrenics, that's why they say schizophrenics, their brains work differently, because they're just being flooded with DMT, this was, again, this was an idea that was going on. And you've always heard that the schizophrenics are tuned into another frequency and they're able to see things that aren't there. And it would make sense that they would outcast these people in society because they're able to see through the veil. They're able to see things. I know a schizophrenic and I don't believe that they're tapping into something different because the entities that they're talking to don't tell them anything that they don't know. They don't tell them some other, like when you have a DMT trip, you're left with more questions than answers. These, these entities aren't telling me anything. So I believe that it's just some sort of, again, mental disorder where they're hearing things. Because whenever he talks to them, it shows him, these entities show him, uh, he says that they bring up a screen. And on that screen, he's able to see his life. But it's only his memories. It's not memories of something else. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Joan of Arc was said, they, some people said she was schizophrenic and she was having visions. And we know that she was a powerful woman and she helped defeat the armies and all this stuff and this guy was her right hand man now i link this to parsons when parsons took his oath of the abyss and uh, or his bornless one ritual i believe I, I forgot which one it was uh he stated that he was the reincarnation of four different people one of these people being this gaz the rights guy who was uh, a prolific serial killer in the medieval times and he was uh, tied to the murder of hundreds, maybe perhaps thousands of children at this time. And I found it really weird that they, that, sh that this guy wrote two chapters on the on this thing. And it, it was the way he starts the book is very lightly treading. Hey, we're going to talk about werewolves. Here's all these stories. And he starts to get more and more graphic with his details of the accounts that people were having with werewolves like one of the accounts was one of the werewolves like to grab people's mouths and open their skulls up like peel their faces back i'm like holy i'm i'm reading this my like, holy shit this is crazy and again the the they, they get if you want to read something it's pretty gnarly some of the accounts in here but again it gets into detail and he has two chapters on this guy uh, the first one being the presentation of the accusations against him. And he was really nonchalant about it. But I found it really interesting that this was one of the people that Parsons uh, said was the reincarnation of. That he saw himself within. And he also compared himself to other serial killers within uh, history. Uh, this being one of them because he was tied to royalty. He was Joan of Arc's right hand man. And he was a royal. He had a castle and all this stuff. And he was accused of, again worshiping the devil and making a deal with the devil. I believe there was also, 
I might have read this somewhere else that he was able to shape shift and do all these things. If you look up the case of Peter Nears, which is a medieval serial killer, he also was able to turn himself into a cat. Again, back to the shape shifting aspect that when they make a deal with the devil, when this Peter Nears guy had a bag of human fetuses in his little bag, his little satchel, he had human fetuses. And he had a deal with the devil where he was on the devil's payroll. The devil would literally pay him a payroll. And he was eventually captured, but for the longest time, he was able to turn invisible, uh, was able to do all these supernatural things because he had a, he had made a deal with the devil. There are, why are you laughing? If, if you, because I'm just imagining like, <laughs> what if you could go into Planned Parenthood and come back out with the ability to become <laughs> invisible? But you don't, you, Thomas, you don't know what they do with these bodies. You don't know where they take them. They use them for stem cell researches. Uh, you know that this is, this is true. There's, I saw some guy was injecting himself with his, with the stem cells of aborted fetuses that he had, his own children. So you My have God. this. Kronos and Saturn. Who was it? Nygar. I don't know who the fuck that is, but I, I read it somewhere. Or I heard yeah. it. I think it was one of the well, Telegram. There was a South Park episode too, where uh, where Superman was like would would get himself out of the wheelchair. I forgot his name. Christopher Reeves. He would like inject you know stem cells directly into his legs, and then he could like stand <laughs> up and walk again. <laughs> but th but it, this idea of again child sacrifice, deal with the devil. There's all these things that's linked to supernatural abilities, and this guy, in the second part of the trial, the, the sentence and the execution, he said, hey, I've done nothing wrong. You know what I mean? I was just acting on my own behalf. I wasn't acting on any other thing, and he's like, I would, I would fucking do it again. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and I forgot what his last words were. I'm going to look up his last words, but he said something some fuck shit at the end of it. Werewolves him. are going to werewolf, my bros. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so he, he presents this idea... Again, to what Thomas was saying that, like, hey, people were werewolves, yeah, cool, and they would do the same shit that people later on learned that they could just do without having to be a werewolf. It's like, damn, I want to dress as a furry, but I don't want to be a furry. It's like, well, you could still do it, bro. You know what I mean? Like, you could still kill people and, and drink their blood and all that stuff. But you don't have to be a werewolf. Really, dude? No, fucking sign me up. I'm going to look up his last words. There you go. I'm it's like the metal that. version of a furry. <laughs> Yeah, that Nygar fella that you were talking about, he's like the uh, Jeffrey Epstein of Canada. He's he was, Really? Yeah, he was into impregnating women and then paying them to have their abortion, paying them bottom dollar to have their uh, whatever aborted, and then he would inject it. Into what himself. was Jeffrey Epstein into? He was into the whole, I believe it was epigenetics. I, th I learned that recently, I think it was, where he wanted to seed... Uh, he had a ranch, and he wanted yeah. to seed, I think it's like 37 women or something like that, with his babies. And he was also uh, real big into transhumanism stuff. He was donating millions of dollars to science. Like, he was right. linked to a bunch of, of, of projects. You know what's... That you know, there, there's something really crazy about the Epstein thing. The Jeffrey Epstein making a bunch of his own babies or spreading his own DNA, mm -hmm. like... Raising an army of himself, that's what uh, Boba Fett's father did. Uh, you know, or I get the two confused. There's Jabba, Jabba Fett and Boba Fett. But the father of the yep. Boba Fett, his father was the alpha. He was the progenitor of all the clone army. So the entire clone army was his genetic seed. <laughs> And wouldn't it be crazy if we got into some kind of war, some kind of battle, and they started raising a clone army, and they all look like fucking Jeffrey Epstein? Well, wouldn't to add to that, to add to that, I wasn't going to go there, but I'm probably going to go there. Because at the end, uh, this guy, they burned his body, right? So they hung him, they cut the cord, the the it fell into this thing, it's, this cradle of iron prepared to receive the corpse. The body was removed before the fire had gained any mastery over it. It was placed in the coffin, and the monks and women transported it to the, to the whatever. Any according to the wishes of the disease of the deceased. And one thing that I learned uh, this past, this this week actually was the fact of family trees. Right back to the bark 
back to the tree moss aspect now people had family trees and they would spread the ashes of the of their family members on that family tree and the tree would absorb that person right and this tree was in the lineage of people uh, for for however long it's it's the whole thing behind avatar right the movie where they want to cut down the sacred tree but the tree is connected to everything now i didn't know that there was very old trees here in florida Right, there are the like ones the, that the meth heads haven't burned down yet. Yes, exactly. The meth head that burned the tree down. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> there are very old trees now. One interesting thing was I linked another Henry that was here in Florida because I, I recently met, I made a new friend, and he died. He goes balls deep in esoteric Florida, and I made I made a new friend. And he told me about how there was another Henry that came to Florida. Another Henry it was Henry Ford, and Edison had come to Florida and they were driving around. Oh, let me know the, when you want to do a deep dive, bro. I'm I'm all Bro, they were trying to look Ford and Edison for rubber trees here in Florida and they were transplanting. <laughs> so check this out. This is where it gets interesting. They were transplanting trees from different areas not indigenous of here of Florida and they would build their own gardens and one of the people Henry Flagler has this crazy fucking tree at the White Hall. And it's a tree that's supposedly, again, linked to this whole indigenous thing. It's almost like a mockery of the indigenous people. Like, hey, here like I have a black this mask. tree. That's what a black mask essentially a, is. An inversion, exactly. So these guys were bringing exotic trees, one of, one of trees. They were taking it away from their, their home where they were at, where it had been with these people for thousands of years or hundreds of years or whatever it was. And they would transplant it up and transport it to their ranch. Here in so they were literally having all these trees from all over the world, almost like some sort of spiritual garden, if you will, for their own harvesting of souls or whatever it may be. Because it goes, you know, if oh, it's bro, dude, when you say harvesting of souls, <laughs> the, this is uh, one of those random tangents that doesn't come up often. But at, at the Edison House, bro, um, Henry Ford deeply believed in all this like Egyptology and sort of like reincarnation and soul transference. He literally believed Madam psychosis. That if you could capture someone's last dying breath into a little bottle, that you could use that to then reincarnate them elsewhere. And at the Edison House in Fort Myers, I believe there's a tiny little glass vial that's supposed to have either Henry Ford's last dying breath or Thomas Edison's, and it's up on display. And I always thought that was fucking crazy that, like, wow. if that's real... Like someone could just go and like snag, you know, like a little piece of Edison or Ford and freaking recreate them if they had the technology to do it. Mm -hmm. Like the, the wow. ingredient is right there. That yeah. is uh, yeah. the reason I brought that up was because these guys uh, they were burned and their ashes were spread places. And then, if you're a serial killer that has killed hundreds of children, why would they fucking care about your wishes? After the fact that you're dead, right? They didn't let the body burn completely, and they just took it and, and they buried it. But uh, very interesting. <laughs> he was like, "Yo, last request, just medium well. <laughs> <laughs> Not well done, just medium well." Uh, you know, one thing I want to point out because we've mentioned that term "serial killer" many times in the show. That that word uh, used for that behavior was injected specifically into the collective uh, with the Son of Sam killings, with that uh, the Summer of Sam. And a lot of people don't uh, think of this when they hear serial killer. You know, we make jokes about fucking breakfast and shit like that. But actually, it goes back to uh, uh, Cirrus is a goddess of the harvest. And I find it just... Just it has a twinge of nefariousness that we were given this term to describe something that's horrific and ter you know scary, frightening, uh, gnarly, but it has a twinge of veneration to it, where I think we're giving it a level or we're instructed to give it a level of respect that puts it in a in a ritualistic context. So when we say serial killer. We don't look too close. Where a lot of people actually look away immediately. But in fact, we were given a ceremonial, ritualistic term for the word ceremony. There's the ceremony and the serial killer. It is a ritual, and we're calling it that. We're being quite impeccable, uh, putting it into a spiritual context. 
uh, when we describe it with mundane words. It's just something to think about. I, I wanted to, to to bring us on like a slightly different tangent, but it's completely related to this werewolf thing. And it's one of my favorite topics that I, doesn't even come up anymore. It used to be big in like the early 2000s and my, it came up in my mind control and MK Ultra research. But what a fascinating topic that's directly related to, I think, the origins of some werewolf stories. And that's of feral children. And these are kids that were like raised by wolves. You know, the, the phrase like, what well, were you raised by wolves? Well, this is because literally, and I think because of that 30,000 year connection with men and canines and that like man's best friend that every once in a while, if a human baby is still, you know, it's essentially gestating outside the body still for its first two or three years. And in those formative years, if it's literally abandoned out into the woods, it can be raised by animals. And one of the most common animals especially in like Germanic and, you know, romantic sort of cultures, you're not going to find them being raised by monkeys and stuff and, um, you know, exotic birds. You're going to find them raised by dogs and by wolves. And um, there's all these really cool mind uh, experiment and it gets into like the mind control aspects of it. But once you actually train, like once a child is raised by wolves or dogs, there this one's controversial. It's called, I think, the, the bicameral or the bi um camera ball mind theory and mind, essentially yeah. the as a child is going through its learning of uh language and structure and just logic in general in those first like one to three years if it's been raised by animals it almost gets to this like point of no return and it's not that they can't ever become a human again but that the right and left hemispheres of the brain if you're being raised by wolves and you're just always acting on like your animal instincts and you don't have any higher level thinking essentially like your left brain starts to shrink a little bit because that's where language and some kind of like societal structure is formed um but i mean this is literally a human turning into a wolf uh, there's no other way to kind of look at this concept of feral children and i don't think they had uh the the idea of like oh yeah those children are feral and then if we put them through therapy and we slowly train them to walk on to let you know bipedal instead of walking on all fours and stuff um but i don't think they had that you'd probably find a bunch of feral children out in the woods and be like all right we got to kill these kids like there's, there's nothing else to it we got to murder these werewolves you know um but this was seemed very and uh, especially in a point in time when like um, see, you know, child protective services couldn't get called on your ass and you couldn't worry about, you know, like going to jail for just like dropping your nine kids off in the middle of the woods and saying, you know, have at it. That might have been a infant very side. real dynamic, you know? Yeah. Infant side was really big during the medieval times as well because people couldn't feed their kids. So they would literally just throw their kids out. Yeah, or eat them. I mean, that was uh, the, the other very natural response to that. So you've got here you got in the medieval times uh, specifically, if you're down on your luck, you can either throw the kids out and they become wolves or you can eat them and you become a wolf through cannibalism. And it plays. So there was actually a I, I, I don't know if it was in here. Maybe it was. But there was a case of a child that was feral and he was raised by wolves and back then these kings had some fucked up sense of humor and they had actually took the child in to their court so they could entertain his his friends and shit right but they had this wild kid that was supposedly raised by wolves running around the castle or wherever it was and he lasted for like seven years but it makes me think of rudolph the the rudolph the second with john d uh <laughs> he was said to have had a a collection of midgets he had a collection of little people and he would collect them for whatever he was fascinated with little people and he's he had really a collection <laughs> yeah exa exactly exactly um, i mean that might be where that comes from where well, he had this literally an army of little people he was obsessed with them and it just it just shows you the mind of these of these weird kings back then they could literally do whatever they wanted and this guy was like yeah i just want to have an army full of little people <laughs> so he did you know what i mean and but there is a story of a of a child that was pharaoh and they kept him in the court of this king i forgot i'm i don't know the name and uh yeah he was kept around just for entertainment purposes but 100 percent, i do believe that some of these kids were raised by these wolves you know yeah i i have heard that uh it was a, a long time ago some random you know uh d documentary on wolves they said that the the male wolf has two weaknesses, 
And the first weakness is that they are unable to resist uh, playing with a pup. That there's they're wired so that if they see a puppy, they're compelled. It's in their instinct to play with their pups. Uh, and the other weakness that a uh, adult male wolf has is uh, uh, blood, when, after they feed, they become blood drunk. And uh, being blood drunk is, uh, you know, they all have their meal and they literally like lay around like a bunch of fucking, you know, like they, they just had their uh, orgiastic climax. <laughs> they can't even bring themselves to lift their head, but they become blood drunk, which is an interesting term. Uh, One yeah. of my favorite stories, it was uh, towards the end of the book, chapter 15. And really, the end, because the end is a sermon on werewolves, uh, the last chapter. But the anomalous case, the human hyena. <laughs> and uh, th that one really stood out to me because I, I found it so funny where it's pretty much a story of this husband that spies on it. Because there was this idea back then that women, any woman, when they, they would go into the into the woods at night. And, and, and another connection with, with the werewolves was the, the Sabbath. A lot of these people would attend Sabbath when they would be accused of being a werewolf. They were like, yeah, I dressed up as a, you know, that I got that wolf skin from attending a Sabbath and I got it from the devil himself or something like that. So uh, this, this guy would follow his wife at night into the woods. And one night he followed her into the woods and he saw her uh, feeding on a corpse with a bunch of ghouls. And every morning she wouldn't eat her breakfast. And he always wondered why she never ate her breakfast was well, because she was feeding at night with her ghoul friends right there. She was having an affair with a ghoul or some shit. And uh, at night she would go out and feed. And one night he followed her and he saw her. He's like, oh, shit. You know, she's, she's, a, she's a fucking ghoul or something like that, whatever she is. So he goes back and the next morning uh, he, he makes her breakfast and she's like, he's like, hey, are you going to eat? She's like, no, no, I don't, I don't really feel like eating right now. I'm, I'm full. He's like, are you going to eat or not? No, 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 I'm, I'm full. He goes, yeah, you're full because you're feeding on people or whatever at night with your ghouls. And apparently she freaks Ruining out. Ruining your dinner again. Yeah. <laughs> and she tries to bite his neck and, and feed on his blood, but he ends up killing his wife. He ends up slaying his wife because he had accused her of having an affair with ghouls pretty much like she was at night going out and yeah. eating people with her ghoul friends like there, there, uh, there's right. so many different links to this too I, I sent you a link to uh it's just the wikipedia page on where hyenas but it it reconnects to everything that we've been talking about all night and there's some a couple examples but it mentions that there's a members of a, what's called the core cult in mali and these people literally become hyenas by imitating the animal's behavior through masks and role play what else is do we just talk about wearing a mask and role playing sympathetic magic you know crowley following the dude this is the exact same mechanism here but it also lists three other ancient cultures that specifically had to wear hyenas and they're all related to werewolves in particular which is mind-blowing so one of them is that um in 1406 there was a guy that wrote about hyenas being vampiric creatures that attacked people at night and sucked the blood from their necks. And this is where hyenas in 1376, there's a Persian medical treatise that talks about Kafter who are known as to be half man, half hyena who have the habit of slaughtering children. Some such a specific uh, habit, right? To be a, a ch like a serial killer of children. And then the last one here, it says, that the Greeks, up until the end of the 19th century, so modern times, believe that the bodies of werewolves, if not destroyed, would haunt the battlefields as vampiric hyenas who drank the blood of all the dying soldiers. Yeah. Uh, and I just find this so fascinating that like these hyenas and werewolves are so directly connected in multiple ways across multiple cultures. Yeah, yes. that's, the, that's the Greek version of the werewolf. It becomes a vampire after the after he dies but there you have it well, in specifically what, a culture? vampiric hyena yeah. yeah what was the african culture what, what what culture was that uh mali was one but there's also somalia ethiopia Sud um, sudanese people they all have versions of this were hyena versus a werewolf which makes sense because you're not going to see as many wolves exactly. in the desert right it, we have this hyenas. this it's a sort of 
elemental that manifests itself in, in the boundaries of, so in China it was dragons, in India it was t tigers, where tigers, in Africa it's where hyenas, because what, what the fuck is in the desert, you know, hyenas right. and stuff like that, and right. uh, wherever it was in Germany or wherever, Paris, it was wolves, because there was more wolves, probably coyotes, canines laying around, so it yeah. manifests itself as the cultural boundary of right. that it has, it's really, really intriguing. Yeah, you know, uh, one thing that I find uh, I have seen reflected uh, covertly, it's not overtly uh, put forward, it's implied sometimes in a lot of art and stories and mythology, is that the werewolves are natural enemies to the jinn. And that is really profound. It's as though the jinn have dominion over the desert and the werewolves have dominion over the grasslands or the uh, the woods. And that's really, that's really uh, just something to, you'll see it, you'll see it out there uh, in interesting, uh, you have to read into it. It's not put forward for you to know uh, explicitly. You have to uh, imply it from the, some of the uh, signs and symbols, but I have a really fun story that uh, I'd love to just lay out real quick uh, in my backyard where I'm living here in Indiana. Uh, in my childhood, we had a location known as the slaughterhouse. And the slaughterhouse was a pig slaughtering factory. And it was up and running for a very long time. Um, but they shut down the slaughterhouse uh, before I even uh, was old enough to know that it was a thing. So when I was going through middle school and high school, we drove by the slaughterhouse on the bus every day. It was part of my bus route. And it, over time, it became more overgrown and more mythologized. And then when I got into high school, I would hear the older kids talk about on Halloween, you go up in that slaughterhouse, you'll see the spirits. You'll see, you know, you'll see uh, all kinds of paranormal activity. So then my day came. I'm up, I'm driving around. It's Halloween. What are we going to do? Me and my posse were like, let's go to the fucking slaughterhouse. Let's check it out. So we all go in the slaughterhouse in the, the double dog there uh, in the slaughterhouse is to <laughs> give up your flashlight and walk around with no flashlight. And it is creepy as fuck. They got the pentagrams on the walls, hail Satan, spray painted, you know, pretty sure some Satanists are doing some shit. And you actually, we heard somebody moving around in the back. And we Get all fucking scared. Fuck, fuck that. We all oh, ran no. because we were did, pretty did sure. Did anyone some... stick their dick in the hole? <laughs> <laughs> Satanic glory that's, hole. That's that triple dog there at the end of the night. That's right. That's right. So then I, uh, so uh, now it's, you know, phew, that was so long ago. 20 years have gone by. Well, they demolished the slaughterhouse. And they converted it into a dog park. It's now a dog park, and this is hitting a chord for me. And here is where only those in the know realize the significance of giving over the slaughter grounds to a, the symbol, symbolically, to the dominion of the dogs. Because Anubis, a jackal-headed god, is the caretaker for the underworld. For those, he's the undertaker, you could say. And now let's take the letter S, let's take the S off of the word slaughter and you get the word laughter. And what do hyenas and jackals do? What is their <laughs> signature move? Laughter. Laughing. <laughs> yep. It so, me out. so the guy who owns that place, he's a, um, he's a the guy who owns the dog park. He's a vet. He's a veterinarian. And I just find it very interesting that he would be the one to know the significance of converting it into a dog park. One of the things that made me think about was, I'm pretty sure it was in this book, where it talks about how children were fascinated by the slaughter of animals. That whenever they would see an animal, they would all come around and, and watch it. And it makes me think of, it. I think it talks about a, a pig or something in this book. And let's not forget the swine symbolism where uh, the the demons were casted into what the swine and then they were pushed off. Talking about legion. We are legion. 
Yeah, exactly. So uh, again, very intri- We're always we've we're always fascinated with death and all this stuff. You know, like uh, reading the gory bits of the book and looking at the details. Like, oh wow, that's fucking gnarly. There's always been this this morbid aspect to it all, and there's definitely a lot of killing in this book. And yeah, it made me think about that. And also, the swine is. I don't know if you've ever if you've ever killed a hog, which I have. They're very human like. They're very uh, when I remember hunting my first hog, uh, bow hunting it. When I was standing there with, with my friend in the blind, I I it was during the day. This is the first time I had hunted during the day where I could see the pig. It was always through night vision or through thermal or something. And I remember looking over at my friend. I go, dude, I feel like he's. I feel like he's looking at me, dude, because he was looking directly into the blind, but I don't think he could really see from where it was at. And I told, I remember asking my friend, I go, dude, can he, can he see me? It feels like, it feels kind of wrong because he can kind of see me. I'm about to, you know, hit him on the side with an arrow. I kind of feel, I kind of feel bad. You know, I felt like it was like, like this human uh, attachment to it. And my buddy looks at me, he goes, dude, I don't think he can see you. I'm like, yeah, I feel kind of bad now taking this, this, this hog out. If because you want to feel a little bit extra bad, man, that the, uh, pig fetuses, as they're developing, they actually have more nerve endings that develop in their pineal gland than humans do. So they actually potentially, if you believe in the pineal gland being like the seat of the soul, they technically develop it farther than most average humans do. Well, dude, wow. the wow. guy that the guy that I bought the property from that bear that I adopted Barry from because I, I adopted Barry. Barry was part of this family. Well, they had they had uh, animals, right? They had goose and, and, and cows and they have the gator in the like the cow and the gator would intermingle in the same pond. Right. So I adopted Barry from this guy. And one of the things a story that he told us while we were there looking at the property was he had a pig where the pig wouldn't leave him alone. The pig was kept pushing his snout into him, and the guy was doing his thing around the shops. There's various shops around the house. It's like a, it's a 10 acres, and he, the pig is on him. The pig is on him. He's like, bro, this fucking pig won't leave me alone, dude. What the fuck? So he gets to the point where he smacks the pig on the ass, and the pig just goes running, you know, just uh, honking whatever the fuck they do out away. And then uh, he goes up and he tells the daughters, hey, I just, this fucking pig won't leave me alone. She's like, oh, what's he doing? He's like, just keeps coming up to me and just won't fucking leave me alone. She's like, dad, the pig just wanted a hug. So the pig literally was wait because the kids would hug the pig and he would get a hug from Aww. it being a, so literally the pig was just wanting to get hugged and he would leave you alone. But the dad didn't know that he just smacked the pig on the ass and the pig was ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah bro so that was, that was a funny story because now thomas is telling me that they developed the pineal gun uh, pine, the pineal gun is supposedly dude and they, they're so they're so close to humans in so many different ways yeah That's the why, organs like, pig hearts and pig livers mm-hmm. and freaking pig valves but also um eyes uh like if you look a pig in the eyes a, a pig has very close to human eyes um, to the point well, that's where why that, they even do re like retina reconstruction using parts of pig eyes. When the pig was looking over at me, bro, I felt different. It wasn't just like some any like when a deer looks over at me, it's just it's not a fucking thought behind those <laughs> eyes. But <laughs> when I saw this hog, and it was the first one I had ever killed, with when during the day he looks at me and I felt kind of weird, like because all the other times it had been at night through a scope. You know what I mean? It hadn't ever been with an actual, you know, uh, uh, compound bow. Had I been with a crossbow with fucking... Yeah, it's not the same it. as, like, shooting from a fucking helicopter. With yeah, exactly. Goggles, right? <laughs> exactly. So I felt this connection. And that's what I know about hunting, where you feel a connection to that animal Bro, that you killed. Th- you this know? is a little bit tangential, but, like, uh, on the... I don't know if you guys watched uh, Alone and, like, the most recent... I love that show. The, the most recent the final season... season. It, it, it blew my mind because there was more than one person that left because they just like killed one too many squirrels and they were like bro like i know i'm out here and i know i'm starving and i know that i have to kill that squirrel in order to like stay out here and survive and if i don't kill the squirrel then i go home and i eat a burger that means someone killed a cow so like at some point like you're killing don't something be a bitch someone. Yeah. but bro like like two or three people went home because they were just like I can't get these cute furry squirrels like out of my head and I just keep like slaughtering them and massacring them and just like 
you know, like they just felt so bad about like all the killing. And we're just talking about a squirrel, man. I can imagine if that your only source of protein was that you had to just kill pigs all the time. Um, it, it turned like it's, bro, it's the, the weird screams, because, the bro, fucking the, the screams, screams dude. The, the, just the, the human likeness and everything about that. You either have to just absolutely worship the animal and like, you know, appreciate it. Like, the, like the whole native American, like, you know, I fucking, I'm going to use every little bit of you just to show you how much I appreciate. Or you have to go that factory farm route where you're just like, they're fucking beast of burden. They're animals. They don't have souls. They're just, you know, you know, factory farm sort of like inputs. And I'm here to, to justify the output of it. But bro, like, like you're saying, you know, once you actually look at it in the eye, um, yeah, it like, it makes you want to be a vegan until you only eat salads for a week. And then you're like, all right, something needs to die. <laughs> yeah. It's fucked up. I wonder about that. Uh, the fact that, you know, we have this factory meat industry, does is the karma still passed on or is it dissolved amongst the masses so by taking one animal and feeding it to a hundred people are they getting <laughs> one one hundredth of the karma of the kid? well or i mean also though if you go to mcdonald's like that burger probably has like 40 different cows in it right <laughs> right right so, yeah so there's something really weird about like parsing out the karma incrementally uh, and I've often thought about that, like, you know, a, a, I think it would be a, I'm sure they're out there, but it would be a really badass survival course to, you know, tr train up people to be there, to be a hunter and for their, uh, their f first kill to be like utterly ceremonialized and with its personal touch, you know, everybody's got their own, you know, they bring their own ancestors to that kill and they can honor that, uh, that passing in their own way. I gotta ask you, Juan, was the was that pig any good? Was it pretty tasty? So hog is you can only make sausage out of it, and the sausage is fucking delicious. Please. It was so, yes, delicious. Because they die so quickly, you know, they they again given good shot placement. We've had a couple bad shots, but I mean they still go down regardless. But the shot placement, they'll go 30, 30 yards and they're down. You know what I mean? They're not they're not running. And getting all that adrenaline, they don't. He doesn't even. They don't even know. Usually, her because Sal, she doesn't even know that she's been hit. You know what I mean? She'll mm -hmm. just literally just drop dead. Thirty yards, twenty yards over. Again, if you get them right. If not, you're gonna have a long night if you even end up finding it because that's also happened, unfortunately. Nice. Yeah, that was a cool. Uh, that was a cool share that you guys. Uh, when you guys went bow hunting for the fish. That was a fucking huge fish you got, Thomas. <laughs> that was that Thomas, was, yeah. That was beautiful. You gave it to the uh, to the guide. Yeah, I mean, I, I could have brought it home and vacuum packed it, but it started raining so hard that like everyone just like packed up and and went home. Like, what am I fucking supposed to do with this fish and like torrential downpour? You know. <laughs> nice. So, so yeah, you know, one more thing I wanted to point out. Uh, Back on the serial killer factor, uh, you know, when the uh, Son of Sam killings were going were going on, there's a lot of uh, research around that that is really filled out, a lot of details that slipped through the crack. Uh, but one thing that I find really interesting about the Son of Sam killing was in that summer that that was happening, they had over 80 dogs were also killed at the same time. And... Uh, that little factoid slips through the cracks, but um, what I think that's telling us is that there was uh, possibly more than one killer, that there might have been an entire cult involved, and the killing of dogs uh, is part of the MK Ultra Mind Control program. You know, they depict that in uh, The Kingsman where they get the, uh, the trainees, the assassin, assassins to be, they get them to attach to a puppy. They each pick out their own puppy and they have to rescue the puppy and they make all this attachment to being the savior of the puppy. And then the day comes where they get the command where you got to kill your best friend there, pal. And it's a, you know, a symbol of allegiance, but it breaks something in their mind. And I just think that that's an interesting aspect of the son of Sam killings that, uh, a lot of people don't think about that, you know, it was probably a, 
a program, uh, a, a larger program than is ever going to be disclosed to the public. Yeah, shout out to a, a guy named on YouTube named Manny Grossman, who's going like super, super deep into that. If you're interested in in that, he goes and he walks around all the spots and he gets into like um, some of those like pagan rituals that I think were related to a lot of that. His name is Manny Grossman. Shout out to to Manny. He's the man. So do you guys want to add anything else? Because I haven't. <laughs> I'm ready to go, bro. <laughs> Come on, let's, let's get I need the to, fuck I'm out. Ready to, I got to get out here and turn into a werewolf before midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to add on the scale of you need to read it and not maybe not buy it, or you know you need to read it and buy it, or you're like absolutely must have. I think this one falls under. Uh, you can just read it. Don't have to really buy it. It's a pretty good read. It's a short read. It's only 170 something pages, I believe. 190 yeah. something, 94, 194. Uh, so I would highly recommend this book, The Book of Werewolves by Sabine Baring Gould. You guys want to add anything else before we get the fuck out of here? Because I'm hungry. Uh, I think you're right. I think it is a, a probably a must read, maybe not a must buy, but uh, the fact that it was so proliferated and it's so. Uh, people reference it uh, so prolifically. Uh, it is. It's kind of a, a foundation to, you know, uh, and it put a lot of uh, terms and words that I never would have seen before. You know, I'm even thinking about the word Holocaust in a new light. You know, is it a Holocaust? You know, we're talking about slaughter. Uh, you didn't talk about Moses, bro. Fuck. Yeah, they, uh, there was a part in there they talk about. Uh, packs of werewolves uh, crossing through bodies of water uh, in the basically a reenactment of Exodus where Moses splits the sea. Maybe some anti Semitism uh, baked into that particular <laughs> chapter. <laughs> yeah, but it was uh, it was a good one, man. I'm glad you put me on this path because it brought a whole lot of light to a whole lot of interesting little aspects of my own research. So, yeah, big ups. Yeah, and I gotta say, I, I mean, I, I grew up. Uh, I mean, I'm not this old when it came out, but I remember watching the Universal Monsters uh, werewolf movie, and that was like the the classic, you know, and I saw it like every Halloween. But that was as far as I really understood werewolves, and I realized that there was some mythology behind it. But, man, this book is the ultimate reference starting point. It's basically uh, a Cliff Notes version of werewolves way before cliff notes ever existed right and this that's what makes this sort of like the central authority on all sorts of historical werewolf uh, information and it's probably not the end all be all but it is absolutely the most comprehensive single easy to read digest book out there so if you're even slightly interested in werewolves as a topic as just like a novelty or as like the the you know mythological origins of it all the way to what I, I thought was interesting is like this whole entire Salem witch trial side of history that was just about werewolves being hunted down and killed. Um, I didn't realize that they had their own Salem witch trials. There was like a Salem wolf trial going on at the same time. Uh, so all that was interesting. Uh, if, if you like werewolves, it's probably a, a buy it just because it's such a great reference book. But if you got a passing interest, that's worth reading one time over. Because, like, you never know when, like, the topic of werewolves comes up. You're like, oh, actually, Pliny the Elder mentioned. You know what I mean? You can be that guy now. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what? I wanted, uh, I should mention this because it was, there was a strange synchronicity on the very moment, uh, Juan, that you invited me to the show. I remember, yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, I had, uh, I had a visitation in my backyard uh, of this strangely, uh, light toned fox you know it was it was a red fox but it was like particularly almost albino you know it was very light uh, light tone from what usually what i see in foxes and i recorded it on my camera i was like oh look at this i've had them out there before uh on also synchronous occasions in the past so uh it was only five minutes maybe 10 at the max that you shot me a copy of this book and invited me to maybe do this show. And I open up the book to cruise through it and I see that it's 216 pages long. And that just blew my cap because 216 has been haunting me for months now. I can't get away from it. 
uh, it's a, a big piece of my uh, my research it's over on my sneaking channel. up right behind you right now, man. Watch out. It's the 2161. What the hell? <laughs> so, so 216 is very interesting to me. In Gamatria, it's a T A X, it's tax. It's also the Tau, T A O, is also 216. And six times six times six is 216. So the tax code is intrinsically uh, revealing six times six times six. Uh, but also Fox, F-O-X, is 666. Really? Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the fact that I had just seen a F-O-X, a 666, then you invite me to do research on werewolves. And the book itself is 216 pages long. I was like, yeah, we're on the right path. We got to do this. Yeah, how many times does it have to happen for it to just stay mere coincidence, Thomas? I always tell Thomas that, that we had a crazy synchro as of recently. And so, yeah, let's plug our stuff at the 101 Podcast, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all that good shit. Make sure to like this video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Check out the Patreon. I got exclusive content on there. Patreon.com slash the one podcast. And yeah, and Gabe and Thomas, you can plug your shit. Yeah, man. Slick Dissident on YouTube. That's my main channel. I also get down with the uh, Weaving Spiders webs on Saturdays. And we do a show called um, Flow State uh, Wednesdays. And then uh, my other spot, you'll probably see me a lot, is uh, uh, Chance Garten's Interverse. Uh, and also Vibrant on Wednesdays with with Chance very frequently. And you can catch him over on Rockfin. It's a good place for that. Much love and respect, y'all. And um, the Paranoid American, paranoidamerican.com, at Paranoid American on Instagram. And hopefully you found us through the Occult Book Club, and that's occultbookclub.com. She'll bring you to this and the, uh, the OG dog dick conversations. <laughs> it was uh, Paranoid what? Again, <laughs> paranoidamerican.com. Uh, I wish I could hit my paranoid American theme song, but unfortunately, I cannot. There, there's I multiple, so we're gonna have to unveil one of the new <laughs> ones in, in the next one. Yeah, I had a fucking magnificent time here with you all, and yeah, I will plan to do something next. I don't know how the generator will get with it. Maybe we'll do another cryptid or something. I don't know. I'll, I'll look around the dark corners of the interwebs to come up with a really interesting topic because this book had it all had cannibalism had murder had true crime had magic <laughs> had consciousness had metempsychosis had all tech cryptids everything it was and that's jam -packed. when the cannibalism started and that's when the cannibalism <laughs> started so thank you for everyone that tuned in and was in the chat appreciate you catch you guys on the other side bye peace guys